Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pick Aside Podcast. My name is Joel Moran and I'm here with Joe Dells and it's now episode 178. In this episode, we are going to talk about teams we feel like won and lost to draft, biggest steals, which rookie receiver and quarterback will have the best seasons and more. A quick Patreon shout out to Alexander, Nazir, Dwayne, Kushgod, Riv Smells Like Deer Ankles, Scary Terry, Icon, No Cap, Anthony, Caleb, Travis, Drews the Goat, Holmes, Nairi, your boy Nick, Pimp Chimpin, Jake the Snake, Corrupt, G Boog, Kobe, Dylan, Mason, Riv's Hair, Mad Sexy, Gentile Drew, Kate MVP, Mark, SP Vorzi Shot, Jordan What, Evan, Dylan, Joel is the Goat, Mayo, Andre, Peter, Daniel, Ben, Ruthless Rootster, Kill Moves, Joel B, S.A. Crimes, Kevin Ness, Eagle Dollar, Tizzy, Corey, Get Funko, Dylan, Playboy, Orlando, Big Chuck, Michael, Greg, Cole, Liam, T. Grove, 17, Tua Sucks on Cup, Ryan, Barcelona, Epic Lankiness, It's Black Ace, Anthony, BJ, PJs, Langston, Jazzy Juice, Johannes, Dave, Muffins, John, Sean Triplett, Burner Hoops, Court Cousins, George, Hakari, and Jay Aqua. Good old Jay Aqua. Got a feeling for Drew. Yeah, we needed that. I was here. I was ready. Last episode, Riv didn't say good old Jay Aqua. He just let it rock. He just let it slide. I'm not surprised. These names are getting out of pocket. What was the first Riv name? Riv smells like like deer ankles. What does that even mean? Uh, I guess deer ankles smell bad. I'm guessing. <laughs> no, I mean, I've never these names are getting ankles. out of pocket. Yeah, me either. Yeah, we have so many names. We're gonna keep on giving giving them shout outs for sure. For sure, That's I can't believe no one said good old Jay Aqua. That's a staple of pick aside. Yeah, like, for sure. So things are kind of different, right? Because it's two of us. Usually we have a three band show, but uh, Drew is studying for an exam uh, that he's taking tomorrow. After that, Drew is going to be back on the show with us. Riv. Um, couldn't make it today, so it's just Joel and I. We're gonna talk about football. You know how to get the PFF guy on here to talk about this stuff. So on to the first topic of the show, the NFL draft. We were supposed to record this last week, and I understand it's a bit outdated because the draft was last week. But teams that won the NFL draft, I know there were a couple. I know the Jets are for sure one of the teams that we both have, but. What teams did you think won the NFL yeah. draft? And real quick, before we get into this, a shout out to Drew. He killed his first exam. Let's give him a clap real quick. He had exam Tuesday. He said big exam of his life. He killed it. So shout out to Drew, and he's going to do he's gonna do great tomorrow too. Um, a few teams I think that everyone's talking about already, Jets, Eagles, and Ravens, right? We kind of know at this point, all the media outlets are talking about it. The Jets had a plethora of first and second round picks. The Eagles got A.J. Brown and a couple other guys in the Ravens with their ridiculous class as well. But there's two teams that I kind of wanted to cover here that I don't think are getting as much credit as they should. Um, and I thought had really good drafts. The first one's the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, earlier in the offseason, I was labeled a Pittsburgh Steeler hater by a lot of people because, God forbid, I don't like Mitchell Trubisky being signed when they have Deshaun Watson and Joe Burrow and Lamar in their division. But I really liked what they did in this draft class. First pick, obviously, being Kenny Pickett. You know, he wasn't my QB1 overall. But as long as you're trying to get a quarterback, that's okay with me. He might not have the highest upside but he's going to come in right away and he's going to compete for his starting job. They have Mitch Trubisky there if Pickett isn't ready or if they want to at least let Mitch start for the first couple of games, get Pickett you know, accustomed to being in the NFL. But at least you have a quarterback now. You have someone the fans could get around. And you know, people in the building too. Like We have a franchise quarterback, which they haven't felt in a while. Obviously, Ben, the last few seasons, have been on his last legs. And they didn't really have a replacement for him. Mason Rudolph is obviously not that guy. Duck Hodges is, God knows, he's not that guy. Um, So first pick being Kenny Pickett, I thought was great for them. Round two, George Pickens. He was my fifth wide receiver in this class. Had him ranked fifth ahead of guys like Chris Olave, who went 11th overall. George Pickens is a boomer bust guy, but when you go to the Pittsburgh Steelers and you're a wide receiver, there's probably an 80% chance you're going to be a superstar. He has all the physical traits to be able to do. He's a five-star recruit coming out of high school. As a freshman at Georgia, he led the team in receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. You don't do that as a freshman unless you're a really elite player. He did tear his, did tear his ACL in March of 2021, which is why he fell to the second round and why he didn't get as much hype as a lot of the other guys coming out. But when, in terms of just pure talent, athleticism, you know, George Pickens is up there with all the rest of the guys in this class. Just a matter of can he stay healthy and in this landing spot, he's not going to be asked to do a ton where they have Deontay, they have Claypool, Pat Fryermuth, Najee Harris. So he's going to come in and be able to be that wide receiver three. They lost James Washington. He's going to be great. And a couple of their later round picks, round three, uh, DeMarvin Leal from Texas A&M. 
lot of people had him great as a you know a day two interior defensive lineman. I thought it was really good value for them. To it missed all of last season. Cam Hayward's going to be 33. He's a really good player. And then lastly, Calvin Austin from Memphis. Sauce Gardner actually said that he was the toughest wide receiver to guard in anyone he's guarded. So that's pretty high praise. So the Steelers are my winner. And the other team I want to highlight as well is the Falcons. Now, I know we had talks. I'm not sure if it was off air or, or on camera that... We kind of went back and forth with what the Falcons do with the eighth pick. I thought they wanted, they should go receiver. I think you thought more just best player available, edge, tackle, whatever it might be. But they got Drake London at eight overall, which is a phenomenal pick. They don't have the quarterback figured out, which is fine. They have Marcus Mariota. They drafted Desmond Ritter as well. But at least at this point, the Falcons can build an offense. Now you have Drake London. You have Kyle Pitts, two big body just mismatches no matter where you put them up. And then we'll see what happens with Calvin Ridley. If Calvin Ridley is able to come back next season and you have Calvin Ridley, Drake London, and Kyle Pitts, that's automatically going to be one of the top 10 weapons room in the NFL as long as Drake London progresses as we think he will. They also got a couple guys in the later rounds like Troy Anderson in round three, one of my favorite linebacker prospects in this class. 6'4", 240, 4440. He played quarterback and running back in college as well. He's extremely versatile. And then in round three, getting Desmond Ritter. Taking a chance on a guy that there was mocks of him going in the first round. He has the talent. He has the leadership. He's going to be someone that could come in and process things really easily and quickly. So the Falcons are not getting talked about a lot, but I really like what they did in the draft. Yeah, those are all some really good teams. I like what the Falcons did in the draft too, especially when it pertain when it talk when it comes to their weapons room. And they all have Auden Tate. So Auden <laughs> Tate with Drake Lendon. I mean, what was our number? What was our number on Auden Tate? We had a bet. Was it a eight hundred? Eight hundred. Yeah. Okay. I think he'll get. I love still. that. I love that. Now they got Drake Lendon too. Auden Tate, Drake Lendon, Kyle Pitts. Now, I love that Cordero for the Falcons, too. Cordero Patterson. I like that for the Falcons. And Drake, Drake Champagne Poppy, made a bet that he was going to be the first wide receiver taken. Damn. And it did, in fact, happen. He wasn't, was he the, I don't think he was the favorite. I don't Drake? think he was either. Yeah, I, think I think it was, it was Garrett, Garrett Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. yeah, Garrett Wilson. But Drake Leonard was a phenomenal pick. I like Desmond Ritter, too. We'll talk about that more when we talk about the quarterback situations and stuff. But for me, I feel like a lot of teams won the draft. Just starting out with the Jets, Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson, Jermaine Johnson, Brees Hall, uh, Jeremy Ruckert, Michael Clemens, Max Mitchell. Like, Michael Clemens is somebody who could probably be a starter. Like, he has a physical upside to be that. I don't want to get too in-depth with the Jets because I know that we talked about them last episode. But the Jets hit a home run in this draft. There's no doubt about it. The Ravens, to me, won. I mean, everywhere they picked, they got the best player at that spot. Kyle Hamilton now makes up the Ravens to me are going to have a top five secondary in football. Stay healthy. Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams. That it, uh, that alone is enough. Tyler Linderbaum now fills Bradley Bozeman out that he left. David Ojabo, who's probably going to redshirt this season, but he gives them the edge presence that they've needed. And Travis Jones, defensive tackle, who was the best player where he was picked. He can be a starter Fill in day one, Calais Campbell's future, even though he signed with them recently, it is still up in the air, so he can feel that need later on. Jalen Armour Davis, I thought was a very good pick too. Isaiah Likely, who's a tight end, but it's kind of like a wide receiver too. Also, um, I like that pick a lot. So I thought they did, they did a lot of good stuff in Charlie Kohler as well. They're just filling up this tight end room because we know they want to run the ball. That's their scheme. That's what Greg Roman likes to do. I thought they killed the draft. The Chiefs, another one, Trent McDuffie, who was one of my guys in the draft that I think very highly of. And the fact that he was there at pick 21, I thought was surprising to me. George Karloftis, Sky Moore, Leo Chanel, like all these guys were really good picks. And the Chiefs, despite having uh, one of the later picks in the draft, did well. Now to shout out some of the teams that aren't very good and I don't expect to be very good this season but they filled some really dire needs. The Seahawks, Charles Cross, now replacing Dwayne Brown. They have their left tackle of the future. They drafted Kenneth Walker, who, whether you think it was Brees Hall or Kenneth Walker, people consensusly thought those were the top two running backs in the draft. We don't know what's happening with Chris Carson, Rashad Penny. Those two are always hurt. Boye Mafe gives them an edge rusher. Abraham Lucas, four-year starter at Washington State. He can start right away at right tackle. The Seahawks in this draft essentially got their left tackle and right tackle of the future. And Kobe Bryant and Tariq Woolen. Tariq Woolen is 6'4 and ran one of the fastest 40 times at the combine. He is the he is the prototypical Seattle Seahawk corner. 
And one of those guys that you just bank on because he has such a huge upside, he did play wide receiver, so it's going to take him time to adjust. But the Seahawks cornerback room is very thin, so they're going to have opportunities to play quickly, and who knows, they can be very good. I thought the Panthers did well. Just Icky alone now solidifies their offensive line, getting Matt Corral. They needed a quarterback, and people have talked about Matt Corral as the best quarterback in his draft, at least Chris Sims did, and he's somebody who quarterback rankings tends to age really well. And then the Texans, I thought, made a lot of good moves. I think they drafted four four starters in this draft. Sting Lee is going to start. Kenyon Green is going to start. Jalen Petre, Petre is going to start. John Mechie is going to start. Christian Harris is going to start. That's five starters. I didn't even get to Damian Pierce, who could be six starters. The Texans legitimately drafted five to yeah. six starters in this draft alone, and all these guys have some legitimate good upside. I think John Mechie can be a 70 to 80 catch receiver. Christian Harris can be your starting linebacker. Derek Stingley, franchise corner Kenyon Green, just a all-around good guard. And they're building their team solely up, solely but surely, and all these teams, to me, just did, a, did amazing in the draft. And Ravens, Chiefs, we know they're trying to compete at the highest level. They filled their needs. Panthers, Texans, Seahawks, and Jets, all teams that have been at the bottom of the barrel but are now starting to up. build their team up. So yeah. I thought all these teams did really well. It's funny that this is the at least perceived as one of the worst draft classes you've had in a while. But I feel like all the outlets, regardless of where you look, Everyone had like A's and B's, right? There yeah. wasn't, I feel like in past years, we saw way more C's, D's, and F's. But this year where there just wasn't a lot of consensus, so value was all over the place that you got guys went in rounds two and three that people thought, oh, he could have been a late first round pick, an early second round pick. So it's interesting to see that you have all of these different opinions on players. And then once the draft is over, everyone came together and said, everyone kind of had a really good draft. You know, I think some of the teams you expected, like the Jets with all these first round picks, but then you have the teams like the Ravens who moved up and down the board, got a lot of talent in the Eagles as well. And, and as you mentioned, the Chiefs. So it's all teams that are kind of in different places in their franchise. Like, like you said, some are competing, some are rebuilding. But even it seemed like the Texans, this was a perfect draft for them because for one, they got a bunch of starters, but it's because their team's bad, right? There's not many guys on that roster right now that they see as long-term franchise-type players. So they were able to go and get a bunch of guys, even in rounds two and three, that are going to go out and start for them right away just because the value is all over the place from all these different GMs and front offices. Yeah, I agree. They all had a pretty good draft. Now, you mentioned that not a lot of teams in this, in this draft lost, but we're going to mention some losers in this draft for me, I'm just going to start out, I think the Bears lost. You know, like, I, I think the Bears got good players. Kyler yeah. Gordon is a fine player, even though I do have my concerns about how he's going to transition into the NFL because Washington played a lot of zone. Trent McDuffie was that that team's primary corner, and they targeted Kyler Gordon. While Kyler Gordon did fine, I think most of his hype comes from his physical profile rather than how he performed in college. And I don't know if he's going to be a long-term starter or not. Jaquan Brisker, I like that pick. But then you look at these other picks like Velas Jones, who's who just started. turned 25. Like they, they went all in on defense in this draft. I don't think it was the right decision, in my opinion, maybe for those first couple of picks. But it, it just feels like the Bears are the one team where I look at it and it doesn't feel like they had a very good draft. Yeah, I hated the Bears draft and I had some, I tweeted something, I don't remember what it was, but I got like five or six replies. I don't know if they're from Bears fans, just NFL fans. I like Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker. Yes, they filled two needs. The Bears secondary was terrible, but let's be honest, the Bears team last year was terrible all around. It's not like their offense was good. The offensive line, the weapons outside of Darnell Mooney and Montgomery, I guess. But and Allen Robinson. Even Allen Robinson had his worst yeah, he year was, of his he career. He was bad, but he's still a name. He's a talented. Out there. He's yeah. talented. Yeah, he went to the Rams, obviously, now. But the reason I have the Bears as one of the losers, I, have, I think I have one or two other teams, but... This ride with the Bears is you didn't build around Justin Fields. Like, Velas Jones is the highest draft pick you took, and he played six years in college. In those six years, he had one season over 300 yards. It was his senior, his sixth year senior season as a 24-year-old. Like, you're 24 years old going up against guys who are 18, 19, 20. You're just physically more mature than them mentally. You've seen everything for six years now, so it's not surprising that you have. He had 800 yards. It's not like he went out and put 1,700 yards up. He had a very mediocre season at 24 years old in college, which is ridiculous. Like, A.J. Brown is 24 years old, and he's been in the NFL for three or four seasons now. So I didn't like what the Bears did, not because the players aren't good, 
but because you're, you're coming into this and you think that you're going to be helping Justin Fields out, right? That has to be your number one priority right now is, is Justin Fields the right guy? And there's no way of really knowing that if you're not going to build around him. We talked about it a few shows now that if you're not good within your first two years in the NFL, odds are you're not going to be good for the rest of your career. And that might not be fair in some cases, like for the Sam Darnolds, but Justin Fields can easily fall into that basket where his team just never supported him. He never had the culture support him, the offensive line and the weapons around him. And now you get rid of Nagy and Pace and you bring in this new regime and they don't do anything really to help him out. They lost their best guard, James Daniels, to Pittsburgh. So their offensive line took another step back. And you really look at the team. It's David Montgomery. It's Darnell Mooney. who are both good players, but we're not looking at either of those guys are elite options at wide receiver or running back. So for me, the Bears are a big loser because you're not going to know next season. You're going to have the same debate. Oh, is it Justin Fields bad or do we have no weapons around him? So the Bears were the number one loser for me just because I thought they'd do so much more to help Justin Fields. The two other teams, I don't know if I would call them losers, but I didn't really like enjoy their picks or at least agreed with them. The Patriots, I'm not a I'm not going to sit here and lie like I studied Cole Strange film from Guard from Chattanooga, but in terms of like everyone that I respect, you know, Jeremiah PFF, he was a round 3 type guy. And you know, there is some things that he does well. I saw he has a really good first step. He gets off the line quick and it wasn't need since they traded away Shock Mason, who is a top five guard. I don't know why they and decided decided to do that. So it just seemed like a reach there. And then Jaquan Thornton is someone I could actually speak to because he's a receiver. I didn't really like this pick. He ran a four two eight forty, which was the fastest among all wide receivers. So I understand why he went so high in the draft. But at six two, one hundred eighty pounds. I don't really know if he's someone that's going to translate well in the NFL, especially because he's really not a good yak receiver. He averaged 3.9 yards after the catch, only broke 11 tackles on 143 curry receptions. And then they took him over George Pickens, Sky Moore, and David Bell. All three of those guys I liked way more than Jaquan Thornton. You have to think, if he didn't run in the 4-2s, would he even be in this conversation for a day two pick? So what the Patriots did, it seems like every year they make some really questionable decisions. They needed help at guard and at wide receiver. So I understand drafting for need, but you also just have to get the best player. And then the last team we talked about a little bit was the Saints. Alave and Trevor Penning were the two players I was down on the most coming into this off, into this draft season. Um, Alave, I just didn't view him as a wide receiver one. And you got to think, they traded away multiple picks to get an extra first-round pick from Philadelphia. They used that pick to trade up again to 11 to get Chris Alave and, and passed up on him over Traylon Burks and Jamison Williams, two guys that had over Olave. And then Trevor Penning at 19, he's a he's a really good athlete, but he's still a raw player. He had 16 penalties his last season at Northern Iowa that he has to fix up um, or fix in general. So it, it's, again, similar to the Patriots where there was a need at tackle because arms had left, a need a wide receiver because, I mean, they have no one outside of Michael Thomas for the last three, four years. So I understand that, you know, getting the players in, at least you have some talent there, but I just would have taken other guys over them. Talking about the Bears, they now are banking on players that got drafted last year to take a step in the right direction. Tevin Jenkins at left tackle, he didn't have a good year last year. Although he did struggle with some injuries, when he played, he wasn't good. Larry Burham, who was a late round pick, they're counting on him to be the starting right tackle. Like they don't, they're they're counting on a lot of breakout seasons from people who probably shouldn't or are not going to have breakout seasons and. Talking about the Patriots, I think Cole Strange is actually going to shape out to be a good pick. But the rest of their draft to me is are, are players that I'm not really too high on. The Taekwon Thornton pick was the one that surprised me the most. History of players that have fast 40 times at the receiver position good. aren't good. John Ross, Rondell Melendez, Jerome Mathis, Marquise Goodwin, the only one that succeeded is Henry Ruggs, and you can succeeded with quotation yeah. marks around it. You're, we can't even really call him a success. Yeah, no. But those are the players. And Velas Jones, although I know you're not very high on him, he didn't have 300 yards. He he had solid production throughout his college tenure. He did. He have how many seasons did he have over five? So 2017 yards? USC, he had 760. 2018 he had 483. You're looking at receiving yards. No, I'm looking at that, kick return yards. Yeah, that, that yeah. caught me too because I remember I wrote this down. I went back and checked, and I was like, oh, it's kick return yards. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Thought, I thought so. Yeah, like. Yeah, because I looked at it too. I thought, yeah, you're right. So, yeah, he only had one year where he had over 300 yards receiving, and that like was that, his last that's year. That's ridiculous. 
Six I thought year. he was at Tennessee the entire time because I would have given an yeah, excuse. He transferred. Yeah. Tennessee had Jericho Gorantano, who's not a very. But good even still, like you see all of these guys that don't have great quarterbacks. I mean, like Traylon Burks' quarterback is not good, yeah. you know. And you have a lot of players that had that situation. But if you're a good player, especially in college, you're simply going to dominate the other player if you're an NFL guy. The Patriots. I, I liked the draft. I liked. I liked some of those picks. Marcus Jones. I liked Pierre Strong. I liked. Uh, Bailey Zap just as a backup quarterback, yeah, I like. Quarterback. You know, it, it's really hard to really nitpick teams that had bad drafts because I think every team at least had two, two to four players that can make a significant impact on the team. It's when your um, first picks I don't like. Yeah. That's like if you if you miss on a fourth or fifth round pick, you're gonna miss. But it's when you have especially these teams like the Patriots and the Bears who had for the Patriots a late first round pick and the Bears who just had second round picks. Like, I want guys that are going to come in and produce right away. And while the Bears, I guess they will produce, it's just if you have a marginally better secondary, is it really worth the offsetting risk of Justin Fields is going to struggle for another season? Yeah. To me, it's not worth it. So I put out uh, power rankings on Twitter Went that crazy. received a million impressions. Crazy yeah. crazy. yeah. A lot of people mad. Bears <laughs> fans were especially mad. Yeah. Because I last. had the Bears dead last in, in the entire NFL. And Bears fans were like, man, oh, Joel Moron. Oh, how, 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 very funny. You know, it's it's so funny because I saw so many of those replies on the Power Rankings list. Oh, man, I think you should, I think you misspelled your last name. It's an O instead of an A. Oh, my God. Like, I've been hearing that joke since forever. It's yeah. so old. But people are mad about the Bears being last. And I'm not quite sure why. Because just just name me. If it's not the Bears, if the Bears aren't the worst team in the NFL, who's who's the worst team in the NFL? I, I just I just pulled up your list right now. I, it's I agree with you. It's just, the Bears. Just it's name the Bears. me a team. Okay, let, let me just ask you this. Okay, the Fal- like the Falcons, but even still, like I like I like what they this got going is, on a lot. This more. is the case. Th- this is what I'm going to say. I understand the Bears have one of the easier schedules, and this is just ranking rosters. Just if you if you're ranking rosters. The Bears have the worst roster in the NFL. You might say, oh, what about Atlanta? Atlanta has a pretty bad roster. But they got dogs. Who, who has better weapons, yeah, Atlanta or Chicago? Not close. Atlanta has a better tight end. They have a better receiver in Drake Linden, who I think is going to be better regardless. Cordell Patterson, I think they have a better offensive line. Defensively, Grady Jarrett is better than anybody on Chicago's defensive line. They have Casey Hayward, A.J. AJ Terrell. Yep. Their secondary is better. The only thing that the Bears have better than the, the Falcons is linebacker because they have Roquan Smith, and even that is a question mark because you got Deion Jones in Atlanta as well, oh, yeah. and at safety and because they have Eddie Jackson and quarterback. But really, how much better is Justin Fields, Justin Marcus Fields is better than Marcus Mariota? I don't He's know. He's better about than Marcus Mariota. I'm just saying the Bears to me have the worst roster in the NFL, and I understand their their schedule is one of the easiest, so maybe they might not finish as the worst team. But if you're ranking their roster yeah. from top to bottom, it's the worst in the NFL. Yeah, I don't like, like I said, I, I hated what the Bears did. When they first brought these guys in, like they were talking up Justin Fields, like they were going to build around him. But everything they've done is the opposite. I mean, I don't know how you're going to go into the season with Darnell Mooney, Darnell Mooney, Vilas Jones. Byron Pringle got arrested, I'm pretty sure. So who knows if he gets suspended. Well. Um, and Equinemia St. Brown. Like that, it's a, it's a really bad receiving core. I agree with you. I don't see any other team on this list. Like even the Texans are better. The Seahawks, Giants. I really don't think it's close. Like Bears fans, I'm a I'm rooting for the Bears. I'm Texans a Justin Fields or Texans truther. have a better team too, yeah, for sure. And it's a first time head coach too. Like who knows how he's going to turn out. So that's why I was kind of surprised with uh, Bears fans being so mad that they're last. Because I mean, yeah, look at the roster. It's terrible. The Falcons, you can. There's something brewing there. Yes. Like I, I see, I see the vision with the especially Falcons. offensively. So, exactly, I see something brewing there. With um, Chicago, I don't see anything happening. No, at all. There's, uh, like, getting... And that's what everyone in my mentions were talking about. They were saying, oh, bro, like, you didn't watch a single Bears game last year. We had the worst secondary, the worst defense in the league. And I get that. But, like, look what the Jets did last season. They had a terrible defense in 2020. And still, their first four picks in 2021 were all offense. They're like, we're going to fix defense. We're going to figure it out. And this offseason, they figured out defense. They got DJ Reed, Whitehead. They drafted Sauce and Jermaine Johnson. They figured out defense. But they said, let's for this first season figure out offense and make sure our young quarterback has weapons and an offensive line around him so at least he could get some confidence. And we could go into the 2022 season feeling like Zach Wilson's our guy. Defense, we'll figure out. If we let up 30 points a game, so be it. We know we're not going to compete for another year. So, might as well make our rookie quarterback 
his life easier rather than, oh, let's just build up the defense and have a marginally better defense. Yeah. Draft day's biggest steals. Now, we can go just simultaneously, and I'll, right. I'll mention one first. One of my steals, Abraham Lucas. Seattle Seahawks, third-round pick, 72nd pick, four-year starter, all Pac-12 honors. He has some first-round traits. Not only did the Seahawks draft Charles Cross to be their left tackle of the future, I think Abraham Lucas is going to start right away, be their right tackle, and hold down that spot for years to come. I thought it was an absolute steal. I'm looking at my steals right now, and I should have included the Colts as one of my winners. So I have a few guys that, that are on the Colts here. Yeah, because um, the Colts killed the draft. I'll start with Jelani Woods, who was drafted by the Colts. He's the most athletic tight end literally we have ever seen. His RES score is a 10 out of 10. It does not get higher than that. He has some technical Antonio things. Gates. RES score, he was number one. Like, there was no one more athletic than him because his size is ridiculous, too. He's like, pause, he's like 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, like, he's a big dude. Um, so Matt Ryan has his Tony Gonzalez. I'm not sure if I'm going that far. His technical skills needs to be, uh, you know, refined for sure. But he has all the athleticism you need, right? And the Colts need weapons, especially Michael Pittman. I know you're high on Alec Pierce. He's a good receiver. He's a bigger weapon, too. I want to say he's, what, 6'2", maybe, right? 6'3". 6'3", okay. He's massive. So they <laughs> they got some guys. They've got Molly Cox. They have, they're building a really big team now that I'm thinking about it. But Jelani Woods is one of those guys that I want to say he got drafted round three, maybe four, actually. Um, that I was surprised lasted that long just because athleticism and speed kills. My next guy, Khalil Shakir, fifth round pick, pick 148 by the Buffalo Bills. He is a technically sound receiver, speedy. He is thin. The he dropped so far in the draft because he had he's had injury concerns. Um, he's had injuries, left knee sprain, left hamstring sprain, foot fra- fracture, leg injury. These are all during his time in college. So I can understand some teams not wanting to take the risk on Khalil Shakir, but he is somebody that. When Jamison Crowder leaves next year because he's only on a one-year deal, I mean, he can step in and be that slot guy. He can be that receiver that is reliable for Josh Allen. And the Buffalo Bills, I thought, had a really good draft, and Khalil Shakir was just the the icing on top of the cake. Yeah, and you saw the interview where he was on the phone to get the playbook on the plane. You got to love that, man. Yeah, the Bills got a good one. Um, I'll go with a uh, non-Colts guy. I'm just going to say, just in general, the the quarterbacks. Outside of Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis, Ritter, Corral, even Sam Howell, who went in the fifth round. These are all guys that maybe in previous drafts, like we saw in previous years, guys get reached on. Daniel Jones, Dwayne Haskins. And this draft class, for the first time in forever, there was one quarterback taken in the first round, and even the next guys were all taken in the third round. So you have these guys like Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter who have the potential to be franchise quarterbacks. I'm not sure if I'm ready to call that call them that right away but the fact that you're able to get them on day two so you don't have to use that insane draft capital on day one because if you miss on a third round draft pick no one's getting fired for that the GM's going to be there the coach is going to be there so the fact you're able to get these quarterbacks in in the late third rounds and you have guys ahead of him from Malik Willis you already have Ryan Tannehill who's going to be here at least for one more season I know there's some controversy around I'm not going to mentor him do all this whatever I think I think he'll be fine and then Desmond Ritter you know He's probably going to be the quarterback out of all of these guys who's going to be pressured to start a re- start right away just because Marcus Mariota has been a journeyman for most of his career outside of, you know, going number two overall. But after that, you know, bouncing around at, at, with the Raiders and whatnot, being a backup there. So he's going to have the most pressure on him to start right away. And I think mentally he'll be good to go. Like he's a really good processor. Um, but the fact you're able to get these guys in the third round and they're quarterbacks and they have talent and they have the physical tools, I think is great for these teams. Next guy, N'Kobe Dean. Third round pick, 80, 83rd pick in the draft. Unanimous All-American player, won a Dick Butkus Award, captain on Georgia's historic defense, and he dropped because of an, of, of an upper body injury, but he is quite arguably the best linebacker in this class. You can argue between him and Devin Lloyd and even Quay Walker. But now, N'Kobe Dean, I mean, sliding all the way to the third round, people were mocking him between the teens. Yeah. That's where you're supposed to go. The fact that the Eagles got him where many people mocked him to go with the Eagles' first couple of first-round picks says a lot. I thought this was a big-time steal. It's good to see that Joe Douglas still has a stamp in Philadelphia. You know, they're still drafting well, he, and he really set the culture there for sure. Um, I'll go on to my next one. I, there's, I'm between two guys here, but I'm going to go with Kenneth Walker. Um, he was my running back two out of this class, and the Seahawks got him late in the second round. I want to say like 62. I don't remember exact, the exact pick, but it was, it was pretty late in the second round, I want to say. Um, Kenneth Walker is my second favorite running back. You know, Brees Hall was someone that I looked at as, 
by far and away the best running back, but at least for the tier two guys, Kenneth Walker might have been in tier of his own. I had Spiller three, but to me, Kenneth Walker was the clear number one or number two guy at least. 5'9, 211. He has typical size, ran a 4'3, 840. He wasn't a high recruit coming out of high school or anything like that. Just three stars, committed to Wake Forest, ended up transferring. Um, but he had a great uh, last season at Michigan State. He was second in runs of 10 plus yards, ninth in breakaway percentage, top 15 elusiveness rating. I mean, all of the stats back it up. And then when you watch him on film, I mean, he's a big guy, 211, but he has great speed. He has great ability to break tackle and even making guys miss an open field at that size. He's kind of, you know, only being 5'9, 211, you would expect him to be not as shifty as he is, but that 438 speed mixed with the ability to, you know, have shiftiness in the open field is really going to turn him to one of the better backs in the NFL. When it, when you talk about the Colts, you know, I could have mentioned a couple guys, Alec Pierce. I mean, that guy's going to be a monster. Jelani Woods, man. But Bernard Raymond, he was a projected first round pick, goes in the third round. He switched from tight end to left tackle in 2020, so he's raw. He's only, he only has 18 starts at left tackle. But all I heard from you and Drew Whoa. before the draft was Colts got to get a tackle. They got to get a receiver. They got to get the – and in the draft, what did they do? They got Alec Pierce who's going to be a great receiver. I mark my words. He's going to be so awesome. Strong. He's going to be awesome. So strong. Bernard Raymond's going to be a starter. Jelani was. He has – like you mentioned, he had the best athletic score. I mean, can he be a top five tight end? He, oh, my gosh. He might be able to. So the Colts absolutely nailed the draft, and Bernard Raymond was an awesome pick. You're ridiculous. I listen. The Colts did they fill needs, but I don't look like Raymond in the third round is ridiculous, right? I think he definitely has a chance to come in and start right away, especially because there's a huge hole at left tackle. Alec Pierce, I'm gonna have to wait and see. I wasn't the highest on him coming out of college. Four four um, one six three. I understand he has the physical tools. I would have to go back and see who they took him over. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I feel like they're oh they took him over George Pickens. Sky Moore. Sky Moore. Uh, David Bell. I liked all those guys more than, than Alec David Pierce. Bell's slow. David David Bell's going to be fine. Um, Say that about Rondell Moore. You like Purdue guys. I, I do have a thing for Purdue. But at least David Bell's not 5'8". Yeah, but you David know? Bell's also slow as hell. I, he'll be fine, man. Alec Pierce is the monster that you're thinking about. He's going to be everything. <laughs> uh, I'm tr- trust me, don't don't let looks be deceiving. He's 4'4'1". Four, four, well, looks be six, receiving. 6'3". 6'3", around a 4'4". Four, four. How six, is that going to be deceiving me? 4'4'1", four, four, because we know, like, you know, white receivers don't have the, great, the greatest track. <laughs> I thought he's light skin. Is he white? I think, I don't know. Yeah, I, think he <laughs> I is. thought he's light skin. <laughs> I don't know. He looks like he's a white receiver. Alec Pierce, I mean, uh, who knows? Um, I don't know. I, I like what the Colts did. Like, overall, the players they got, I thought were pretty good. They filled needs, but, like, I don't look at any of these guys as difference makers. We're going to get into our power rankings later and going to pick apart your Colts at number six. Sorry for the spoiler, but that was ridiculous. Um, I'll have my last. I don't know how many more steals you have. I only have, like, one or two more. I'm going to kind of go the cop-out way here. Trent McDuffie from Washington. Yeah. He was closer to cornerback one for me than cornerback three. I thought I liked him arguably more than Derek Stingley, you know, taking into account his injury history, um, and overall just his play falling off over the last couple of years at LSU. McDuffie's a smaller corner, but he makes up with it. He has great quickness, extremely tough. He's great tackling. Like, he has basically everything you could think of for a corner. He only had a 6.9% miss rate in college. He's able to blitz, and he's been doing it for a while. As a freshman, he only allowed 339 yards on 436 pass cover snaps. So being able to do that as a freshman, that's something that I look at right away. How were you able to produce your first and second year in college? Because if you're able to shut down receivers who are two or three years older than you, especially at that age, like when you're 25 versus 20 in the NFL, it's not a big difference. When you're 18 versus 21 in college, it's a huge difference. So McDuffie was one of my favorite picks in the whole draft. This is Alec Pierce. He looks like Zach Wilson. Yeah, he's white as hell. Yeah, he's white as hell. I told you. That's why I said looks can be, but he has he looks tan when he plays because. So I, I I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I seen the film. I, yeah, but he's he he's gonna be awesome. Him. I'm telling you, Matt Ryan, he's cooking up something. Now, my next deal, Leo Chanel, one hundred third pick in the draft, eighteen and a half tackles for loss this past season, eight sacks, all big ten selection. He just plays with a chip on his shoulder. He's one of those guys that if you really dived into the film, a lot of people said this guy might be the best linebacker in the draft. And the Chiefs have had a knack for drafting guys late in later rounds. You look at Willie Gay, Nick Bolton, now Leo Chanel. Last year, I Trey think, Smith. Yeah, like I think the Chiefs defensively in this draft improved tremendously, and I feel like that's where they really needed to improve. Mm-hmm. Offensively, as long as you have Mahomes, Kelsey, you'll be fine. I'm higher on Juju than most people. I still think he's capable of being at least a low-end number one receiver, which – 
is is manageable low in that wa- offense. Low end wide receiver one. Yes. So you that, think that Darnell means... Mooney's a low end wide receiver one? I'd rather have Darnell Mooney than Juju. I don't know. I think you just say that because as of recently, Darnell's produced more, but Juju yeah. it stays healthy. Yeah, he's better than Darnell Mooney. It's been a while since we saw elite Juju. Maybe that's what's doing it for me. We just haven't seen it. Like, AB left, and Juju just fell off. I mean, he got hurt, and then Big Ben kind of regressed, so chicken or the egg type of thing. But Juju, because if you're saying he's a low on wide receiver one, that means he's, like, borderline top 15. No, it's like 20. That's that's not a low end wide receiver one though. There's a lot of great yeah, but there is because there's 32 teams in the NFL. I know, but that doesn't that doesn't no, it doesn't work yeah, like that. Yes, it doesn't. It, does. it doesn't because there's a lot of teams that have a wide receiver one. No, there's a lot of teams that don't though. Maybe not a lot. There's some. I would say there's less than 10. You're probably right after go through it, but that's what I'm saying. Like there's probably like 15 to like 18 true wide receiver ones, and a couple teams have two. Like I think T Higgins could be a wide receiver one. I think Chris Godwin could be a wide receiver one. But I don't look at Juju so as being... So look, so we'll just go through it. San Fran, Debo. Yeah. Packers don't. Can- Kansas City, they don't. I guess if you Kel- want to count... Kelsey, if you want to count that. Philadelphia, AJ, yep. Raiders, yep. Devontae, Patriots don't. Bill, Stephon, Seahawks, they have two basically in Tyler Lott. Well, I would say DK, just yeah. one. Tampa Bay, Mike Evans, the Bears, low nah. end, yeah, whatever. But no, but no. Denver, are you counting Sutton as a low end one? They don't have a wide receiver one. I, I want to. I want to know what Drew would have said Galladay? if he was there. No, that's five. Vikings. Yeah, they do. To Dolphins. They do. Yep. Washington. They do with Terry. Yep. Rams. They do. Cup. Saints. Thomas. Ravens. Mm, we got away with MC, bro. It's I'm been. Gonna, it's I'm, been a while. Gotta respect it's. Them. I do, gotta but it's been two years. So Ravens. They don't. Six. Lions. Not yet. I like Amon Ra. I love Jameson, but not yet. Colts. Pittman. He's in that Mooney Juju. Like, is he wide receiver one? No, I think I think he's low end, but he is. Okay. But Titans? No. Jets? Jets? <laughs> Jets, do they? No. Okay. Not so we're yet. like eight, Not nine. Yet, but Garrett Wilson can do it. Okay, yeah. yeah, eight, nine. Chargers, they do. Yeah. Panthers, they do. Texans, Brandon Cooks, they do. Yeah. Ja- Jaguars, they don't. No, no. Cowboys, they do. Those are all, all the teams, I believe. So yeah, we're, we're right around 10. And Steelers, which they do. Deontay. Yeah. Yeah. We're so, right around 10. That makes so sense. Yeah. But but it's hard to say because, like, just because you don't, like, those 10 teams, does that mean there's only, so there's 22 wide receiver ones is basically what we're saying. There's about, yeah, low end. There's there's about 22 that are capable of being the best receiver on the team. Yeah. So Juju's outside the top 22. Yeah. Okay. But I think he's low end wide receiver one. Yeah, but like, that's why, like, he, if you're the 25th best wide receiver in the NFL, I'm not looking at you as a wide receiver one. I don't know. You know? I, and the Chiefs offense with Travis Kelsey. He's going to put up numbers. Like, without a doubt, he's going to put up numbers. Do you think Scott Moore has more yards than him? No. Nah. Nah. You Future don't think will. so? Future will. Year one, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, down the line, who knows? Scott Moore is a really interesting prospect, but Juju has done it. Like, he has shown he can be elite when he's given the chance. And it's interesting because you have, you know, that year Juju went crazy. Big Ben had 5,000 yards, and you had Antonio Brown. Now you have Patrick Mahomes, and you have Travis Kelsey. So this has worked for Juju's before. Juju before. He played primarily in the slot last season. I mean, he's going to do that again as well. So if there was any chance for him to do it, he's only on a one-year deal as well. I'm pretty sure it's just one year. Um, so he's going to want another bag. He's still super young, 25, 26 years old. Um, so I think Juju's going to have a really good year. I just don't know if he's a wide receiver one. Now, your other steals? I really only have like one more, and this isn't a steal more so. It's just I love the fit, David Ajabo going to the Ravens. You know, he was someone that was getting buzzed around a top 15 pick. There was some, I remember listening to some interviews, people saying that they feared Ajabo more than Hutchinson. He has the potential to be a really good edge rusher. It was just obviously tearing his Achilles in a pro day was brutal, which dropped him to the second round. But the Ravens, if there's any team that could, I have faith in to take a guy, especially a defensive guy, and turn him around, get him healthy, and let him produce on the field, it's Baltimore. So... I don't know if I'm calling it a steal just because the Achilles injury is always something you could be wary of, but I love the fit going to Baltimore. So I have two, last two. Jermaine Johnson, easy, 26 pick. 1% chance is going to be there. Then Brian Robinson. Ah, going you're to wide, Washington. Yeah, you're running back one. He's my running back. I like, you know, Brees Hall's a jet now. Maybe I have to change that. But Brian Robinson, third round pick, 98th pick. And Washington, they have some good running backs, Antonio Gibson. J.D. McKissick. So what do you what do you expect from Brian Robinson? Because Gibson, I'm assuming, is going to be the guy. Gibson is going to be the receiving back. Look, I then think, what happens with McKissick? He's the natural receiving back. You, you he just do, gets phased yeah, out. He just gets phased out. Comes in some plays. I think Brian Robinson 
can legitimately be their workhorse back. You'd be. Ha- I got him in both my dynasty leagues. The the league I'm in with Drew, like nobody bid on him. I was the only one. I was like, damn, I'll take a free third round running back. Brian Robinson is going to be the real deal. He's going to make some noise in Washington. Maybe have an Alfred Morris like season. I don't know. Alfred but Brian Morris. Robinson, he's a better runner than Gibson. Gibson is a more natural receiver and he can run for sure. But I feel like Antonio Gibson kind of he's Gibson's good. He's been banged he's, up at times. Yeah. Though. But he's more a receiver. But he could, I mean, he really did damage against the Cowboys. In his rookie ago. year, he was really great. He, he, but he, he had, didn't play as well last but year. But like 40% of his yards his rookie year came against Dallas, where he just had two games where he had like a ridiculous stat line both games. But Gibson has like the Brian, chance to be Brian workhorse. Robinson is a physical runner. He's gonna. I think he's the best running back on that team right now. Ron Rivera compared them to Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams. Yeah. Similar skill sets. And, and he's Stewart's Jonathan the bigger guy. Stewart. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's and D'Angelo was more of the versatile guy who could do both. Brian Robinson, I think, can catch passes, um, but I think Gibson and McKissick definitely are more well-suited, at least, for that. And the league's lucky we didn't draft Brian, Brian Robinson. Robinson. I'll take Brees Hall for sure over Brian know. Robinson. I, that's tough. I, it's not. It's a it's tough not. question for it's me. Not. It's not. It's not. Joe Douglas, maybe have to, he, he has to look over his board again. I mean, unless... I, I can't believe... I don't know why that just reminded me of the PFF guy saying uh, how we reached on Brees Hall. Like, that was such a stupid statement. He said that every pick we made was basically bad because we didn't draft a quarterback. What does that mean? Yeah. Like, what, what's stupid? Like, he I, I don't like, want to be rude to the guy, but, like, bro, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, he. what he said was really dumb. I just think, like, sometimes we overthink, especially, like, when we're thinking about building a team and, like, team building in general. Like, getting value and stuff is important, but especially where the Jets are right now where it sounds crazy, but we don't have a ton of holes. Like, linebacker, we need some help. Safety, we need some help. But other than that, like... There's not a ton of holes on this team. So at this point, it's like, who could fucking ball? Like, who could come into this team and make an impact right away? It's Sauce Gardner. It's Garrett Wilson, Jermaine Johnson. And Brees Hall sure was a little early for a running back in the second round. Jonathan Taylor's taking the second round. DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins. Like, all guys that came in and produced right away for teams. And you can't, at some point, the whole value thing, you have to throw it away. Because you have to win games. And Brees Hall is going to help win games for the Jets. What, what would be your opinion on the Jets draft if they drafted... Let's just assume Derek Stingley was there at four. If they drafted Stingley, Jamison Williams, and then Ojabo. Yeah, like, that would have been bad. <laughs> like, that would have been bad. You're taking just a whole bunch of risks, a whole bunch of injury guys. Like, it, they all have potential to be great. Don't get me wrong. But, like, the Jets took the short cornerback in sauce, the short run, uh, wide receiver with Garrett. Like, across the board, all guys that are probably the most NFL-ready at their position outside of uh, Jermaine Johnson because yeah. of Hutchinson and Kayvon. Yeah, the Jets had a great draft, but those were our steals. Now, the quarterbacks didn't go as high as many people thought they were going to go outside of Kenny Pickett. He was a first-round pick, but everybody else dropped in the draft. Matt Corral, Desmond Ritter, Malik Willis. But that's besides the point. Which quarterback drafted in this draft do you think is in the best position to succeed short-term and long-term? Sure. Um. I kind of have the same answer for both. Uh, is it a cop out to say Kenny Pickett? Like I don't know. It's it's the obvious pick, just because the other guys went to good situations, but I don't think as good as what Kenny Pick is Kenny Pickett is walking into. And that's where you get when you're a late first round pick. You're gonna go to a team who, especially in the Pittsburgh Steelers case, they went to the playoffs. They have a history of winning. They have a stable organization, head coach, GM. Even though their GM is leaving for the first time in like 15 years, I don't know how long he's been GM there. Owner across the board. So Kenny Pickett's coming in. The talent is great. We already know the Najee, Deontay Johnson, Claypool, Fryer. You have all of these guys, George Pickens now. So even the offensive line has been upgraded over these last two seasons too. So the talent around him isn't, you know, that's usually not even the biggest concern about rookie quarterbacks, but it's more so is your head coach going to be here in a year? Is your GM going to be here in a year? Because when you have coaches and GMs that are constantly coming in and out, it's hard for a rookie quarterback to stay, number one, in the same system, and number two, in their own head, like, okay, we have a new coach and GM. Am I still the guy? Especially if you're like a late first, second round pick where you don't have that top five type of, of talent or talent's not the right word, but top five of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they invested a top five pick in you. So you know for sure you're the guy. When you're a late first round, second round pick, you know, that's something that you have to think about season to season, especially when you have all these guys changing around. So can you pick it? is by far, I think, coming into the best position, at least short-term, because number one, he's probably going to start. Mitch Trubisky, I think, is someone he's going to be able to beat out, and he has the talent around him. But I I do want to, you know, have some credit to Ritter and Malik Willis, too. Ritter's going to go to Atlanta, where he's not going to be asked to start right away. He's going to have two big-body weapons in Kyle Pitts and Drake London, two guys who are going to be probably two of the best contested ball receivers in the NFL. 
Kyle Pitts, you could label him a tight end or wide receiver. Wherever he lines up, he's going to be a mismatch because he's 6'6 six, six and run, runs a 4'4", four, 4'5". Four, four, so he's a, he's a freak too. And then if you have Calvin Ridley there next season, maybe he even sits the whole season. Who cares? And then you have Calvin Ridley next year. So for the long term, I think Ritter might be in the best case out of all of these guys. He's just the one I have the most questions about talent-wise. Physical talent, like I mentioned, processing I think is great. And then the last guy I mentioned, probably third on this list, list is Malik Willis. Because Tannehill is going to be the guy. They're still going to be trying to win over these next couple of seasons. It's just a matter of, does Tannehill have a 2021 season or a 2020 season? If he's back to his 2020 ways, Tannehill is going to be the quarterback there for another season or two. But if he has another season where he struggles, then Malik comes in. The only issue with Malik Willis starting at quarterback, you have Derrick Henry who's approaching that running back uh, age apex where once you get to 27, 28 years old, 95% of running backs fall off a steep, steep cliff. Derrick Henry is one of a kind, but we did see it this past season. His first time really getting injured and missing a significant port, part of the season. And then his wide receivers. I love Traylon Burks. I'm not worried about that, but again, a rookie. And then Robert Woods, who's on the wrong side of 30. He's coming off an ACL injury, and you don't have much behind that. So Malik, talent-wise, I love. It's just his situation might be a little bit murky. I'm surprised you said Desmond Ritter. For the fact that, you know, short-term, I like Desmond Ritter's chances to... Marcus Mariota has a couple stinkers. He comes in and out plays, and he does have some good weapons. But I look at all these quarterbacks. Kenny Pickett and the Steelers, the Steelers will be competitive. Matt Corral, Panthers, they won't be the worst team in the league. Malik Willis, Tennessee, they won't be the worst team in the league. The Falcons have the chance to have the worst record in the league, and if that happens, Desmond Ritter is getting replaced by Bryce Young. That's true. So that's why long-term I don't see that just because he's the one that I see – he can be replaced in a year if they go get Bryce Young. But Arthur Smith has said that Desmond Ritter, well, he likes Desmond Ritter, and Ritter compares himself to Ryan Tannehill, who's somebody Arthur Smith thinks very highly of when he was in Tennessee. So there's something there. Matt Corral, I like his short-term situation a lot. Kenny Pickett versus Matt Corral. Kenny Pickett is battling against Mitch Trubisky. Corral's battling against Sam Donald. I think Trubisky's better than Donald. Matt Corral can beat out Sam Donald in camp and have that success short-term and have an improved offensive line, weapons, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Terrace Marshall. They got some guys there. They also have um, Rashard Higgins. So they have some got Christian McCaffrey healthy. I think short-term he's in a better position than Kenny Pickett for those reasons just because I think Sam Donald's easier yeah. to beat out than Trubisky. He is, but it's not by much. I think it is. I mean, yeah, you're talking about like the 30th best quarterback compared to like the 35th best quarterback. And Matt Corral, um, also Ben McAdoo, was a very big advocate for him. And Ben McAdoo, somebody who has a great quarterback track record, he has a quote unquote eye for the quarterback position. Mm -hmm. Gotta love those guys. You know, Mahomes. He wanted to draft Mahomes when he was with the Giants, but they didn't draft him. I think he had. Joe Burrow or Herbert as his number one quarterback. I'm not sure one of those, whatever. But just know his track record in evaluating quarterbacks has been good. So there's that. He, I think he had Zach Wilson as his best quarterback in this past draft, too. Yeah. It might have been Zach or Trevor, Probably whatever. Yeah. yeah, one of those two. So uh, what's your answer for short and long term? Who's your favorite? Short term is Matt Corral with the Panthers. Okay. Long-term, it's Malik Willis. You don't worry at all about Matt Rule. He's probably not going to be there next year. No, The offensive that's, line's that's improved. Why, that's why I say short-term. Short-term, I think Matt Corral can start. Long-term, I do worry about that. And who's but your long-term? Pickett? Malik Willis. I just oh, think okay. the potential Tennessee. Uh, look, even Man, though— so no love for Kenny Pickett. No. Why? You know, I, I think Kenny Pickett's fine. He's fine. Yeah. But, that's but I mean, all of these guys are fine. I think he's fine, but if we're talking about short-term— Matt Corral, I think Panthers have a better offense than the Steelers. At least I think in ta talent wise, top to bottom. What? I think they do. Say that again. When we're taking into account the offensive line, yes, the Steelers' offensive line's been improved. It's not as good as the Panthers. Uh, I don't know. I would like DJ Moore is great. Don't get me wrong, but DJ Moore and Deontay Johnson cancel out, and I'll take the out the rest of the pieces. Don't get me wrong, CMC better than Najee, but can he stay healthy? Tommy give Tremble. Me Okay, give me Fryermuth, <laughs> Claypool, George Pickens over the rest of the guys the Panthers got. Well, I'm also looking at the offensive line. I look at Icky, I look at Taylor Mott, I look at Bradley Bozeman, I look at Austin Blythe, or Aust not Austin Blythe, Austin Corbett. Yeah. So, you know. They have I, made improvements. Yeah, they've made significant improvements. But so the Steelers. The Steelers have made improvements, too. I would, Their best this, offensive lineman is James Daniels. I know, but they, they brought in some guys, too, over the last uh, two seasons. I'm blanking off the top of my head. Um, 
I could try to find it. But regardless, I think that you have to take into account like their offensive line. Sure, it might be even marginally better. I still think the Steelers' offensive line is going to be average, right? And maybe the Panthers are a little bit above average. But I still think you have to come to 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 realize that this is a new offense coordinator now coming in, right? Joe Brady's gone. I mean, he was there last season, but regardless, he wasn't good, though. He wasn't good. You're right, but still, a new system. Um, and then you have Matt Rule, who he might get fired week five. Like they start off one and four, he might get fired. So it's going to be hard for Corral to come in and succeed, even if he is great, to have all this, you know, all these things going on in your rookie season as a quarterback. So I'll take Pickett, who I think has a better offensive surrounding him, weapons, offensive line, running back, and plus I get the reliable coach, the guy who has never had a losing season in Pittsburgh. I'll take that over Matt Corral. Especially you get a third-round pick compared to a first-round pick. That's a fair argument, but I think that Mike Tomlin will have his first losing season this year. It wouldn't shock me. I also think... And the only reason I'm not saying Sam Howell, because I, I like Howell live. I don't remember if he's my quarterback two or no, he's my quarterback three, maybe coming out. Um, but a fifth round pick hurts. You know, the fact that he lasts the fifth round tells me that the NFL does not look at him as a starting quarterback. And he has a he chance. He hasn't been good outside of his uh, like first year. Yeah, he has a chance. I mean, this past season, he, he put up pretty decent numbers. Um, but he has a chance because Wentz could struggle, but even still. Like fifth round picks, the chances of them hitting are extremely slim. But I know there's going to be some people asking about um, Sam Howell. The, if he was a third round pick, he'd be in the conversation for sure. But fifth round pick tells me that they look at him as a developmental quarterback. And unless something happens to the the first, they still have Ty, uh, Taylor Heineke too. So he's probably going to be the third string on that team. I'll tell you about pick. What is it? Short term is still Matt Corral. But long term, it's Kenny Pickett just because of stability. Okay. Because I think Tennessee, although I like... They brought stability. in Mason Cole. That's yeah. That was that was the center they brought in. Come he was on, really man. good. Really? He was the 13th ranked center last year. Mason Cole? And how many snaps? Center. 500. 460. Mason Cole? I mean, he, was, he didn't play a he ton. He played in but Minnesota. You're saying uh, he was in the Cardinals last year. Mason Cole? They have him in a Cardinals uniform, so I believe so. No, I believe he was in Minnesota last year. Yeah, he was in Minnesota. He started, oh, he seven, started, he started seven games. He started half the year. Seven? Yeah. No, that's a little less yeah. than half the half year. Half the year. Now, Mason, Man, get out of here. I mean, it's in Arizona he was last mid. year. I know. I think he, he probably got cut. Yeah. But, look, I think Malik, their although tackles, the their te- tackles are bad. Although Tennessee has stability, I think Malik is talented. I don't think he's as talented as people advertise him to be. Like, I don't think he's, like, this Josh Allen-level prospect. You saw what Matt Miller was saying? Uh, Matt Miller, he was on some ESPN show. They were saying that. Players are going to see him in that first practice. They're going to see his arm time. They're going to say, why isn't that guy starting? Why isn't Malik starting? Why is Tannehill starting? He, he was comparing him to Mahomes, his first practices, when everyone saw his arm talent. So I think Malik is going to have that kind of like... Not that, they're gonna, I mean, for me, look, that goes hand-in-hand hand with the comment that Tannehill made. I mean, I was fine with the comment. I don't think that he's going to withhold any information from Malik. I think, yeah, nah. you know, it's a, they're professionals at the end of the day. It's Malik's job to go there, learn, and put his best foot forward. Yeah. And Tannehill's job to maintain professionalism and not be a jerk. Yeah, which he's not. Yeah, I, I don't think he will either. But I, look, I don't, I know Malik has like a strong arm, but I think the talent is a bit overhyped with him. Yeah, well, that just comes with the bad quarterback class. There's going to be one guy everyone likes more than the the rest, and his physical tools are the best out of all of these guys, which is why everyone projected him to go in the first round, and he ended up going in the third round. Yeah. On to wide receivers. Most of a lot of wide receivers were drafted in the first round. We had Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jahan Dotson, uh, Jamison Williams. I didn't mention him already. Christian Watson went in the second round. I'm forgetting some receivers that went in the first round, but there was a lot of them that went in the first round. And then in the second round as well. Uh, Jahan Dotson. Yeah, Jahan Dotson too. It was Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Jahan Dotson, Traylon Burks, Chris Olave. Jamison Williams. Yep, so six. The six. Over five and a half hit. So which receivers will have the best yard will have the most yards this year? I mean, you don't even gotta ask I mean, me this you question. Can, you can give your top ten, man. Top you your top ten? Top ten. <laughs> I had the top three ready. I didn't have a top ten ready. Oh, I have top I have top I have ten. You have ten receivers? I, I have ten. Okay, I'll I'll try to think of some after I, I do my take. But the rookie receiver is gonna have the most receiving yards. Give me my wide receiver one. It's gonna be Trey Lombarks. He was the guy the highest on probably out of everyone in this draft class. Don't get me wrong. Like, I wouldn't have taken him number one overall by any means. But in terms of my favorite player in this class, it was Traylon Burks. And I think the Titans kind of told us everything we need to know about him. 
They were willing to trade away A.J. Brown and not give him that deal because they saw Traylon having a similar skill set. Now, A.J. is one of the best 12, 10 wide receivers in the NFL when he's completely healthy. So I'm not expecting Burks to come in week one and replicate what he did, what he did. But there's some rumors going around that, you know, they're expecting him to take a lot of carries, which he did at Arkansas, as well as playing wide receiver, obviously. But he's going to be used pretty similar to A.J. Brown as a big slot. A.J. played about 72% of his snaps out wide, um, 28% of his snaps in the slot, and two per, and only two snaps overall in the backfield this past season. I think we're going to see a bit different of a percentage. I wouldn't surprise me if it's closer to 60-40 in terms of slot and out wide, at least for his rookie season, because I imagine Traylon being matched up against either a linebacker in the slot, he's going to outrun him, or a slot nickel corner who he's going to be three inches taller than and have 40 pounds on him. So regardless of which way you want to do it, he's going to have a mismatch there. And I'm excited to see him in the rushing game too. You know, he's someone who showed it off at Arkansas, especially his last season. He had 29 rushing attempts for 188 yards and a touchdown in his last two seasons at Arkansas. So he's shown the ability to break away, you know, big plays. He averaged about, what is that, like 10 a carry? That's got like seven a carry. Um, so he, he showed the chance that, you know, when he's given the chance, well, when he's given the chance, um, when they give him the ball as a running back, he can make big plays, explosive plays for the Arkansas Razorbacks. And I think he's going to do the same thing for the Tennessee Titans. And you have to look as well. Like all these other guys, they're competing with a lot of players. Garrett Wilson's competing with Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, a bunch of tight ends, Brees Hall. Drake London's really only competing with Kyle Pitts, but your boy Auden Tate, who you think is going to have 800 yards. Um, Dotson's competing with McLaurin. It's just Robert Woods. It's 30-year-old Robert Woods coming off a torn ACL, and that's really his only type of target competition. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if he leads the team in targets, let alone the receiving yards. And then the guys at number two and three, number two is Drake London. Similar to Traylon, there's just not a lot of guys, not a lot of mouths to feed there. It's Kyle Pitts, and I guess Cordell Patterson coming out of the backfield. But other than that, there's not many guys that are going to be competing for targets. I'm not as high on Arden, Arden Tate or Zacchaeus as you are. Not that you're high on Zacchaeus, but Arden Tate, he's your favorite player. So I look at, at London, and he's just going to get a ton of targets. He's a great player, so he's going to produce. And number three, Garrett Wilson on the New York Jets. He's, you know, linked up with one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and Zach Wilson. He has some guys, well, you can make the argument that he's competing with guys, but you also got to think, okay, defense is going to be looking at Elijah Moore. Defense is going to be looking at Corey Davis. Maybe Garrett Wilson could get some looks there where he gets one-on-one coverage where these other guys might not. And uh, my dark horse out of all these guys is Jamison Williams. Jamison wow. Williams starts wow. week one. The injury concerns, you know, they're, they're there for sure. But if he could stay healthy, man, I mean, he's the most explosive receiver in this class, probably the most explosive player in this class. And it wouldn't surprise me, kind of, it's similar to him and Jalen Waddle, right? Last season, Jalen Waddle had those injury concerns coming into the draft, and he didn't fall by any means. He went number seven overall. Um, but he ended up having, you know, the second best. Obviously, Jamar Chase put up a historic season, but Waddle as well, leading the, you know, um, setting the record for receptions for a rookie. So Jamison Williams is my dark horse, but Jalen Burks number one easily. I'm used to you being wrong. <sighs> Since when? But you being this wrong. Since when? Since when is am I wrong? Blown. Listen, I, I won't. You know, I won't knock you for the Drake Landon and Traylon Burks picks. Okay, they were, they were okay picks. Because well, well, I understand the, the target share is going to be there for them. But this is an easy question. The receiver that's going to have the most don't receiving say yards don't say as Ale a rookie. Don't say Alec Pierce. Not Alec Pierce. It's Christian Watson. 6'4", ran a four three six, And people talk about the, his hands. That's an issue. His drops. People don't understand. At NDSU, the production wasn't there because they're a run-first offense. They didn't pass the ball much. Christian Watson with Aaron Rodgers, he is going to be the best receiver on the Packers. He's going to make an immediate impact, and he's going to lead all rookie receivers in receiving yards without a doubt. That's mm. not even a question. Mm. Number two is Drake Landon for me. Just because I trust Arthur Smith oh, more, I'm the one than who's I wrong. do. You don't have Traylon in your I, top two. He's he's my top three. I have Traylon Brooks third, but I trust Arthur Smith more to to scheme up things for Drake Landon than I do anybody on and t Tennessee's offensive staff to scheme up things for Traylon Brooks. Forrest Garrett Wilson, I understand he's competing with Corey Davis, Elijah Moore. We're gonna be a run first team with Brees Hall. We're gonna try to establish a run early. That's why I have him at four. Sky Moore for me is five. He can be higher, but I don't think he'll get more targets than Travis Kelsey or Juju. That's why I have him at five. Alec Pierce, to me, is a sleeper. He can be all the way at three or two just because 6'3", 4'4", he's a freak, You man. saw Drake London already? Des Desmond Ritter made him look did bad. Did you say Drake London? He made him look... Did you he, say Drake London yet? I did say Drake London. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
I want to make sure I was going crazy. Alec Pierce, six. Chris Olave, seven. I mean, he's a sleeper, too. He is. He just is. because if Michael Thomas doesn't play much, Chris Olave can establish himself as a wide receiver one easy. And Jameis Winston, I mean, he's going to throw the heck out that ball. I trust, I trust the Saints. John Mechie. I think John Mechie with the Texans. Brandon Cooks, John Mechie, Davis Mills, he proved last year he can play. John Mechie can have maybe 70 catches this year as a rookie just because of the situation with the Texans. George Pickens is nine for me just because there's so many players on the Steelers. Deontay, you have Chase, Freyer move. I think it's going to take a while for George Pickens to get accustomed. Jamison Williams is 10, but he's my wild card Dude. because I don't know when he's going to play. Is he? If he starts week one, he's all the way at 5-4 for me. Okay, as long as he's having Alec Pierce. But I feel like, like Jamison Williams might not play those first couple of games, so I have him down on the list. But my top 10 is easy. But number one, solidified, put it in stone, stamp it, Christian mail Watson. it. Christian Watson is going to be the best rookie wide receiver so, this season. So he's just no gonna, he's just going to walk in and Aaron Rodgers is going to trust him. Because we know that's an yep. issue. That's an issue for Aaron Rodgers. He does not trust anybody outside Devontae Adams over these last three, four years. Christian Watson will be the exception. Will he? Yep. The FCS kid. He will. Yep. 6'4". Senior. Athletic, took out. freak of nature profile. He's Listen, Christian Watson's a good player, and I, I think he's going to you know fit in because... First of all, they, they have no one to throw it to, right? They have Sammy Watkins and Alan Lazard. Like, there's there's really not much there. But it's hard for me to sit here and say that he's going to have more yards than Drake London or Traylon Burks. Like, those are oh, two will. guys that I think, without a doubt, are going to have more yards than Christian Watson. Do, do you want to have a friendly bet? What do you want to bet? I have a bet. I what, know what Christian, is, I'm confident. So, is Christian it Christian Watson, Watson, I get the field? Or is it Christian Watson, I get Traylon or London or, or whatever? What do you mean? I'm saying, like, I don't think Christian Watson have the most yards I don't. I'm, he might even be top three. You don't. I mean, based on what you said, you you might not think he's top five. He's, yeah. I mean, I I didn't like. I said I only had. The I top bet three you here. he finishes top three. Hmm. I know he'll top finish two? top three. Top, top two. two? Yeah. Might as well just bet on one. <laughs> I don't think he's having the most yards. Top three. He could sneak into number three. Maybe Christian Watson is different, man. Is he? He's a beast. Is he? Yes, he is. I don't know. Yes, he is. Christian I'll, Watson. I'll take the bet that he he's not top two. You'll see once we st- ha- start having these reports from training camp, Christian Watson is dominating Jair Alexander. Oh my god! I'm, listen, I don't give. I really don't care what happens at training camp because I heard that uh, Justin Jefferson was going to be the wide oh receiver my three. God. I heard did that you, Jamar Chase couldn't catch did a ball. Did you see? Did you see what Christian Watson just did to Eric Stokes? Look. Packers post to Christian Watson, Devontae Adams, kid go and be the truth. Like he okay. knows what he's talking about. I mean, I guess they doesn't have to say that since he's not on their team anymore. But look, I at don't this, think... look at this from training camp. Look at Christian Watson right here. Look at this route. Chris, boy. Right. He ran the most simple slant or slash in route you'll ever Come see on. in your life. That's Christian Watson. He, Christian Watson has all the physical tools. I just worry that Aaron Rodgers is not going to trust him. Aaron Rodgers is going to say, I'm going to throw to like Alan Lazard and Sammy Watkins all day. Because he will. Like, we saw that in the championship game or the uh, divisional game where he just said, I'm going to throw to Tate and nobody else. He doesn't have Tate you know, anymore, even but he has guys he trusts. I've heard uh, um, Theo Ash NFL, who's somebody, you know, he makes some really good NFL content. He talked about how Christian Watson, the comp for him is MVS. Yeah, that's fair. A deep threat. Yeah, big body deep if threat. If Christian Watson is MVS, you don't think he gets 600, 700 yards as a rookie? Yeah, oh, yeah. But that's, I don't think that's going to lead the league or lead the uh, rookies. There's a chance it can, though. Six seven hundred? No, I can't. Yeah, but nah. what it? But maybe he's off, and he's more than MVS, and but he gives you that quality as well on top of everything right, else. So, what do you think Watson puts up this year? What's the, what's the yardage? I'll be over honest. under seven fifty. Over uh, I'll, for I'll, sure. Oh, really? For sure. Oh, seven fifty is a yacht. I'm a thinking lot. He, he might get a thousand. As a you want you want to do the under a thousand? I'll do under a thousand right now. It's, no, over seven fifty. <laughs> That's a fair number. Right, do we do we want to do over under seven fifty or do we want to do? Uh, Someone with one of these receivers, like I'll get my guy, you get your guy. Uh, how about this? How about this? Christian Watson. How about this? I'll get Burks, you get Watson. Whoever has more yards. Okay, that's fair. All right, let's do it. That's fair. All right, that's fair. Let's do it. I know that Christian Watson's gonna be better. No, he's not. Bro. He's gonna. He's a better player than Traylon Burks. He's simply not. Like he played at FCS. He, he was a four year player. Don't like, sleep on that man. Don't sleep on that man. I don't know how you were like bashing Trey Lance for his competition, but Christian Watson is fine. You're right, but he didn't get. Th- <laughs> but Christian Watson was always wide open. 
Yeah, like, I mean Christian like Watson, he did produce twenty yards. Like his sophomore season, he was really good. Like he was good pretty quick. His freshman year did nothing, but his sophomore year, he was good really quick. When I was watching the Trey Lance from all, we stopped and was like, man, who this guy's guy? an NFL receiver? So why don't I think he came out his junior season if he's that good? I, I have no idea, but I was personal like, thing he, maybe he's an NFL receiver. I was looking at him like, yo, he's gonna be nice. And they traded up for him too, so I mean, they have a plan in place. Yeah, and it, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers wanted he liked Traylon. So he was probably he's a smart man. He was probably talking about that Christian Watson pick. He, come on, they don't have they're not similar skill sets though. Aaron Rodgers knows, man. but but Burks and Watson are different receivers. Yeah, Watson's better. No, he, no, he's not. No. Before we go on to the next topic, so there's a lot changing in the NFL world, especially when it comes to broadcast media. Tom Brady just got a big time deal. He's making more money as a broadcaster now than he's gonna than he made in his NFL career. Now. NFL Sundays, Mondays, Thursdays are going to sound a lot different now. CBS, we still have Jim Nance and Tony Romo. Fox, Kevin Burkhart, but now Tom Brady will be joining him after he retires. NBC, Mike Tirico, Chris Collins with Mike Tirico replaces Al Michaels. Al Michaels is with Amazon with Kirk Herbstreet doing Thursday night football. And on ESPN on Monday, it's going to be Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, the old mm. Fox crew. Yeah. Now, which one <laughs> of these duos are you most excited to listen to? I mean, I mean, I guess it's easy to answer Tom Brady, right? Like, I want to hear how Tom Brady sounds. I, I do want to hear how Tom Brady sounds, but Jim Nance and, and Tony Romo are still the best in the game for me. The way Tony Romo is able to break down the game, he basically calls out defenses or offenses, both sides of the ball, what they're going to do before the ball is even snapped. Brady's probably going to be able to do you similar. Think Tom, I think Tom Brady will be a better broadcaster than Tony Romo. Oh, I don't know. Because Romo's showing me already. Like, Romo, I know, is great. He's the best broadcaster across all sports for me right now. So, Brady, even though, like, knowledge-wise, sure, he probably knows more than Romo, it's different than being able to speak and, and visualize it to the audience. I mean, I've seen Tom Brady in Man in the Mirror. I've, I've listened to his interviews. It, I have a live game is different. I have no doubt that I mean, he's, he's going yeah, to be. He's, I, I think Brady's great everywhere. I think Bro Romo is fantastic, but I think Brady is is going to literally change the way we we view it. Oh, I think he's really? going. He's, the, he's the highest paid broadcaster. But what sense? Because Romo is going to do basically what Brady's going to do. Like Bert, Romo, Romo already Romo, does. Romo does great, but he also guesses a lot and he he misses a lot of the times too. Brady's going to miss too. He, not as much as Romo. Oh, my God. We're going to have to keep track of how many times these guys are people, right or wrong. People should do that. I'm sure people, people will. Should do there's that. a whole Twitter account that do that's like umpire I stuff. I do think that there's this thing about Tony Romo. Like, we know he's a great broadcaster, but there's definitely a group of people out there that don't enjoy his commentary style, which his commentating style, which it to me baffles my mind. But I think Tom Brady will be somebody that everybody views as he's the best easily how can you not like Brady? Everyone next Brady, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. Dude, Brady's neckable, man. Pause. What? What, bro? <laughs> Brady's neckable is crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're ridiculous for that, I, bro. Uh, you're ridiculous. We're not going to cut that out. Yeah, hell, Just hell le no. leave that in. Yeah, please leave that in. But Tom, no, Tom Clip Brady, that. I think, is going to be the best. Though. No context. Clip he's, that. he's the highest. He's the highest. He's going to be the highest paid broadcaster by like a mile. Oh, he's yeah. getting like 27 Three, mil. He's getting 300. Year? No, he's getting 37.5 a year. It's 10 years, 375. Oh, yeah. I always wonder how TV, TV networks are supposed to pay that out. Like, do do they even make enough to give out that type of contract? I mean, yeah, their contract with the NFL is like worth billions. So, yeah. And I mean, it's Fox, right? Like Fox has all the other shit that they do. They're, they're more than fine to give him 375. Because it's not like you pay him 375 up front. It's 37 million a year. It's just. Part of the salary, part of the expenses. Thirty-seven mil a year is a lot, though. It's a ton. For yeah, a I mean, broadcaster. like the fact that he's getting paid more as a broadcaster than he ever did as an NFL quarterback combined is ridiculous. Is that going to be the worst broadcasting contract in TV? Is that going to be the Albert Hainsworth of yeah. broadcasting? Is it? Is it? Is there a chance that nah, Brady's, Brady's me good? There's going to be a lot of pressure. Like Romo, when he came in, there wasn't pressure on Romo to be great, and he just did it. And everyone's like, "Damn!" Like he's amazing at this. Brady's going to come in, and everyone's going to expect him to be great right away. Yeah, that's true. On to the next topic, DeAndre Hopkins banned for six games. Banned is so now, November drug tests came back with a trace of elements that were from a banned substance. This was substance. from November? Yes, Damn. it's from a November drug test. And in October and December, he was also tested, but they came back negative. Hopkins has, has said, you know, he's confused and shocked. He hasn't had a positive test in his 10-year career in the NFL. And... He doesn't know how this could have happened because he, he practices holistically. 
Uh, he takes care of his body. He's investigating this. You know, who knows what happened, but the, the point of the matter is that he's not going to play for six, the first six games for Arizona. That's a huge blow. He will be allowed to practice and play in preseason, though, but in the regular season, that's when it kicks in. Now, what does this mean for Arizona without D-Hop for the first six games? I mean, it's terrible for them. For, it's funny that, I mean, anyone who ever gets suspended, they always say, I don't know how this happened. It's, you know, not surprising. But, I mean, it's huge for the Cardinals, who it was obvious how much a blow he was last season once he went down. In 10 games last year where Hopkins played, they were 8-2. In those games, Kyler averaged 8.8 yards per attempt, 72% completion, QB rating of 108. Seven games he missed, they went 3-4 and four or 3-5, and five, including the Rams' playoff loss. In those games, Kyler averaged 6.6 yards per attempt. His completion percentage dropped from 72 to 65 percent. His quarterback rating dropped from 108 to 90 or to 89 percent or 89. So overall, I mean, it was a huge loss, not just for Kyler Murray, but the win loss shows as well, right? They went from A to being one of the best teams in the league. They were the number one seed in the NFC for the first two and a half months of the season. Hop went down, everything changed, and it's funny because Hop was not putting up a crazy hop season, but in the red zone, it was maybe his best red zone season ever. He was leading the league in touchdowns. First eight games, I want to say he had eight touchdowns, touchdown almost in every game, or he had a couple games where he had two touchdowns. So Hopkins, while he kind of gets disrespected, like when we talk about the top guys, we're always talking about Jettas and Jamar Chase and Devontae Adams and Tyreek. Hopkins is kind of a guy who's gone forgotten about over the last couple of years just because I think we're just tired of him, right? He's just great every single year. So we kind of think of him as like, yeah, he's great. We know this. While the other guys who, especially in the last couple of seasons, like these rookies who have come in. So Hopkins is still obviously a great, great wide receiver. But this upcoming season is going to be a lot different for the Cardinals because without him the first six games, now this Hollywood trade makes a lot more sense, right? You trade the 23 overall pick. You have Hollywood who has shown to be a number one on a team, maybe not a prototypical number one receiver, but able to draw number one coverage and be able to beat number one coverage. He did that with Baltimore this past season with his best year by far. You also have Rondell Moore, who was a second round pick last season, more of a gadget guy, probably going to play primarily in the slot and AJ Green, who was there last season as well. So at least going into this season, you lost Christian Kirk, but you brought in Hollywood Brown. So at least that's going to offset. You also re-signed Zach Ertz, who you didn't have early in the season last year. And they drafted uh, Trey McBride too, who's going to be another piece that they'll be able to use in the passing game. Um, but it sucks that's the first six games because it's going to be incredibly important for the Cardinals to get off to a hot start. You're going to be in the NFC West when you have the 49ers who are still going to be looking to compete for a championship, whether that's whatever happens with Garoppolo or Trey Lance. And you have the Rams, who the defending Super Bowl champions. We know Seattle's in a rebuild. So it's going to be really important for the Cardinals to get off to a hot start. We know they did it last season. Didn't end up working down the stretch as they lost in the first round to the Rams. But this is a huge blow to the Cardinals. I agree. Um the Hollywood Brown trade does make a lot more sense now. They were talking about it because they already knew that this was inevitably going to happen, which was a good move. You know, it makes the loss a little bit less. But the truth of the matter is that last year, Arizona went 3-4 and four without DeAndre Hopkins. Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins, 62 QBR, completed 72% of his passes, 8.8 .8 yards per attempt. Without D-Hop, it goes to 46 QBR, 65% completion percentage, 6.6 .6 yards per attempt. Did, were you listening to me or did you zone out before? I was listening to you. Okay, I said those exact stats. Oh. Go I thought it was one of those where you zoned out. But go ahead. I might have zoned out. I'll, 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 I'll be honest. I was th still thinking about, about my Tom Brady comment. Yeah, no, but, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Hollywood makes this blow a little bit less impactful, right? But the truth of the matter is that I've said it, I said it last show. Christian Watson, Hollywood Brown, is Hollywood slightly better? Christian what? Christian Watson? What do you mean? No, no, no. Oh, I was talking about a uh, um Christian Kirk. Christian oh, Kirk. Oh, Kirk. Christian Kirk, Hollywood Brown, they're the same type of guy to me. Except Hollywood's faster. Um, Hollywood's a bit better. Is he significantly better? No, he's but better. If you, I mean, if you take out D Hop and then you have Hollywood, and you take out Christian Kirk, like. Come oh, on, it's the same yet, thing right. to me. It's That's the same. It's the same offense it's to me. Huge. You still have Hollywood, AJ Green, who's even he's going to regress from last year. I'm assuming Rondell Moore, who I view as a gadget guy only. Zach Ertz getting older. Trey McBride is he's he was had the best stats for a tight end, but he is a little bit slow. Rookie and I, tight I worry about that too. Because of that, I just don't really view the Cardinals as a threat this year. You look at their schedule, they have the eighth strongest schedule, and that's maybe even doing them a little bit justice because they play the NFC West, the AFC West, and the NFC South. 
10 games they're going to play this year is against the NFC West and AFC West. That's tough. And outside of those games, you got two more games against the Vikings and the Eagles. So how's that going to shape out? Without DeAndre Hopkins, I feel like the Cardinals are probably going to be a 7-10 and 10 this year, and they're going to miss the playoffs. I don't think this is a playoff team. The defense isn't very good. They lost Chandler Jones. And J.J. Watts coming back from an injury. We know J.J. Watts is a good, great player, but he's always injured. You really can't rely on him for a full season. Their secondary is average. Their linebackers are young, not disciplined enough. And as of right now, it looks like Isaiah Simmons wasn't a very good pick. The offensive line is okay. It's not anything special. And the weapons, you take out D-Hop, you're downgrading significantly. So this is not a playoff team to me. It's not, but this is a chance now for Kyler Murray. He wants that $200 million, $300 million contract. This is the time now for Kyler to say, listen, I could put the team on the back for you know for four or so five, six So if they games. don't make the playoffs, you're not giving Kyler the contract? I'm not saying that. You give the Kyler contract regardless. But this six-game stretch mm, Regardless. Could, yeah. You think so? You, you absolutely a million percent pay Kyler. Mm. What other choice do you have? I don't know. Bryce Young, man. They're not going to have a top three pick. <laughs> Never you said know. seven and ten. That would be like the fifteenth pick. They're not. No, nah, you you pay Kyler because he's up for Will Levis. You you pay Kyler because he's an electric quarterback. He has a phenomenal a phenomenal arm. His legs are ridiculous. Everything you want in a franchise quarterback physically. I mean, he's missing some height here or there, but he has mobility, escapability, and a great arm. You pay Kyler, and you don't think twice about it. But this is what can separate Kyler from that $200 million contract to that 250 300 If he's able to really show out and say, listen, I could win without Hop. I could win when we're down bad. We don't have the weapons I've had in years past. And he could show I could be a leader for this team because that's really the only mark on, Tyler, on Kyler's resume is his leadership. That's something that's been talked about over the last couple of seasons. Can he lead a team? Can he be the leading quarterback? I think he can be. The talent's there. Now it's a matter of, without Hopkins, can he go out and produce, put up similar numbers to when Hopkins is usually on the field? That's going to make the front office much more comfortable with giving him that contract. Also, just to say this, because I didn't mention this before, last five wide receivers selected by the Packers in the second round, Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, Damn. Devontae Adams. Damn. Christian Watson. Damn. He's got some elite company. Your bet's not looking too he's good now. He's got some elite company. Your bet's not looking yeah, too good if now. If he's Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson, Tay, like, okay. He's Greg Jennings with Jordy Nelson. <laughs> oh, God. He's both of them at so the same gonna time. So he's going to be Hall of Famer? It's a possibility. Like, uh, Traylon Burks going to be first ballot, so I don't it's even got to worry pos- about it. It's a high possibility well, Christian Watson. What was wa- what, uh, where'd Watson rank in your receivers? Do you remember? Um, He was top five for me. He yeah. was fifth, I believe. Okay. Yep, he was top five for me. He didn't. He didn't crack my top five, but I, I liked him. Yeah, I Christian do, Watson is that guy, man. He's nice, but he's, he's that not, guy. He's not Jordy Nelson, bro. Now another big time move that happened. Uh, the Saints signed Tyron Matthew. This has been in the work. Well, I don't know if it's been in the works, but he did visit with the Saints, and he ultimately decided to sign with them. Now I don't know about you, but this makes the Saints dangerous to me. Tyron Matthew, you know, you, there are some knocks against him. Him not having long-term financial security last year definitely affected his play. You can see in the AFC Championship game where there are times where he's he it looks like he's making business decisions rather than making a, a tackle. And, you know, I feel like at that point the competitor in you just has to make a play. But regardless, he has the money. He has the security now with the Saints. So I think he's going to play his ass off with them. But Tyron Matthew, I mean, the Saints had the fourth-ranked defense last year. Fourth against the run, 14th against the pass. That passing defense becomes better with Tyron Matthew. The secondary is now Marshawn Lattimore, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, Bradley Roby, Paulson Adebo, Marcus Mann, Tyron Matthew. That is, what, a top three secondary in football? The defensive line, Cam Jordan, Davenport, Onyemata, Pan Turner, first-round pick last year, who didn't get to play, now is going to play this year. I mean, this defense is going to be exceptional. It's going to be one of the best in the NFL. The Saints last year were five and two with Jameis Winston, four and one with Taysom Hill. They were nine and three with Taysom and Jameis. Then you had Simeon. Ian Book. Lost four games in a row. Then you lost then you got Ian Book. He lost the game versus the Dolphins. That tells me that the Saints with just mediocre quarterback play, or at least a quarterback that isn't at the top of the league, with the team that they have surrounding them. They can win nine, ten games, and now you're telling me the Saints got better offensively. They got Chris Olave. You're telling me Michael Thomas is possibly returning back from injury. I mean, 
wow. I mean, this team can make some noise. I mean, mm-hmm. this team feels like a, a playoff team to me. Lock them down in the playoffs. Just lock them up already. Lock them up? Yeah. I, I'm trying to find the – I remember I saw a Michael Thomas report. Uh, I can't remember where it was. I'm trying to find it. Um, but regardless, talking about Tyron Matthew, I mean, first of all, it's a great deal for the Saints, right? Three years, $33 million, paying him 11 a year, $18 million guaranteed, so you're guaranteeing him for the first two years of that contract. Extremely versatile player and a leader on defense. The Saints needed safety help, right? They let Marcus Williams walk. They brought in Marcus May from the Jets. Solid player, approaching 30, coming off a torn Achilles. So I don't think you could really look at Marcus May and think he's going to have a huge impact right away. You know, who knows if he's even going to be available week one. He tore his Achilles midway through last season. Remember the game against the Colts on uh, Thursday Night Football, I want to say. Jonathan Taylor had like 200-something yards. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, yeah, bringing in Tyron Matthews is going gonna, is gonna to be huge. When the Chiefs... The year before the Chiefs got him, they were 24th in points. And the three years, the three consecutive years after that, they were top 10 in points. Obviously, you know, a lot goes into that. But Tyron Matthew, being such a great player and leader, plays a huge role in that. Saints, as you mentioned, were top five in defense the last three seasons. And I don't see a reason why they're really going to regress. The only thing that I will say to push back against their, you know, what was it, five and two, four and one record with uh, Taysom Hill and Jameis is Sean Payton's not there anymore. Sean Payton's one of the best coaches in the NFL before he retired. Now you have Dennis Allen taking over who has been phenomenal for them as a defensive coordinator as we mentioned they've been one of the best defense most cons- uh, consistent defenses in the NFL over these last few seasons I just don't know if that you know translates to wins as a head coach because you have Sean Payne who is really the uh, the main man behind the scenes in terms of offensive play calling and, and you know game planning each week so I do worry what is Jameis who's going to start what's Jameis going to look like week in and week out without having Sean Payton there. I'm sure he's going to be decent. I just don't know if he's going to put up a 5-2 and two record. Um, with that being said, though, the NFC is weak. I mean, the NFC is really not good at all. You have the Bucks, the Rams. I really like the Eagles, Packers, Vikings. But, like, outside of those five, it's like the Saints could be better than anybody else. And even though it, they might be better than the Vikings this upcoming season, too. Um, so in terms of where they're going to finish this next season – They'll probably be a playoff team. If not, definitely in contention. If they're not the seventh seed, they'll be right there in the eighth, ninth seed in the hunt. It's just a matter of what's their offense going to look like because we said their defense is always good. It's just what's Jameis going to look like coming off this injury? What's his offense going to look like with Michael Thomas returning with a different um, play caller for the first time in God knows how long? You're also bringing in a rookie wide receiver and Chris Olave. So it might take some time to gel together. Um, but if the Saints are able to get the offense right, the defense is going to be great too. They could be a playoff team for sure. Michael Thomas and Chris Olave have already started working out together. And the report you're trying to look for, Dennis Allen said that uh, there are a few hurdles. A few hurdles remain yeah. with his return from his ankle injury. I think It's always something with Michael Thomas. Yeah, I think he'll be fine, though. You mentioned the, you mentioned the Sean Payne point. That's a good, good point. You know, Sean Payne is one of the best offensive minds that this game has ever seen. But I was listening to a Dennis Allen interview with Rich Eisen. And what he said in that interview was it was a point of emphasis for him to continue the continuity within the building. The staff is the exact same, just minus Sean Payne. But Pete Carmichael is the OC now, who's been Sean Payne's longtime assistant, knows how he works, knows offense for sure. He's been learning under Sean Payne. He's been working with Sean Payne. The continuity is there. This is the same system that these guys ran last year. It's the same exact thing which means that I don't think there's going to be a drop-off. In fact, I mean, Jameis Winston, full year under his belt. Comeback player of the year? And he, there's a possibility. I mean, he, in six games, 14 touchdowns, three picks. He had a game he had five touchdowns. His touch his touchdown percentage was so outlandish, it just, it's not going to happen again. His touchdown percentage was like 12. It was I don't know. Crazy. He could like throw 12%. maybe 26 touchdowns next year. Yeah, no, that's fine. But he's not going to have 14 through five games. I don't know. Jameis can Was it week, week one? Capable. It was week one. He had five touchdowns. I think he had like 150 yards. Yeah. It, w- it was something ridiculous. Celtics are up 11. Let's go. But Jameis, to me, I think can have a big time year. That offense is improved. I, I don't think the Sean, I, I love Sean Payne, but I don't think the loss is as big as people see, make it seem only because the entire staff is still there. If this was a new regime, new coaching staff, new everything, I'd be a bit worried. But because it's the same staff, I'm confident that. These guys are going to play similar to how they played last year. They're just going to bounce right back. I don't back. know if you could over or whatever you said, overrate the loss of Sean Payton. I mean, it's not just the offensive genius he is, but it's also the leadership he's brought to the city, to the team, winning the Super Bowl. Like, that can't go understated. I think that's a bit rude to, to Sean Payton. 
Yeah, I mean, look, he's a <laughs> Hall of Fame yeah. coach. <laughs> but I think the Saints, they have a chance to be better this year. Yeah, what would they go last year? Nine and eight. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they have a chance to be better. They can they can finish ten and seven. Yeah, if they have some things go their way, eleven sure. and six. Maybe. Do you have their schedule up by chance? I don't. No. But the the full schedule releases in Thursday, at least like the game for yeah. game thing. And I'm gonna make a new rankings based off that, and those rankings are gonna be my predictions for each team and stuff. With like records, that. yeah, with okay. records, and that's how I'm gonna rank it. So record wise, I'm, you're gonna rank everything. So those rumors: Jets, Patriots, Week One, Sunday Night Football. What's the Jets record going to be after week one? One and zero. We're going to beat the Patriots. Let's do it. I'm, I'm, the ter- I'm the Patriots. terrified. Listen, if you're a pick a side fan, you're going to remember this because right now I am terrified to play the Patriots week one Sunday night I'm football not. against I'm Bill excited. Belichick. Don't get me wrong. When September comes around and we're doing our predictions for the game, I'm going to feel like a million bucks. I'm going to say we're going to blow them out. But I'm telling you right now, I am terrified to play the Patriots Sunday night football week one with a billion eyeballs on us. They're oh, not ready. God. They're I'm, not I'm, ready. I'm scared. I just have the NFL. Bill Belichick just is in my head, lives rent free. He just dominates. Remember what I said? I said the NFL is not ready for the New York Jets because after week one, when we put the whole world on notice and we beat the brakes off the Pats and Zach Wilson throws for five touchdowns, Garrett Wilson is over there with 152 tugs <laughs> and Elijah Moore has 80 yards and a touchdown. And you have Jeremy Ruckert, you know, with a play action. Jeremy boot. Ruckert. Oh, my gosh. And Brees Hall running for 100-plus yards. Sauce, Sauce got to get a pick six now. Yeah, Sauce pick six. For sure. And I hate to be, has to be your boy Mac, but yeah. Look, we, people got to understand, the Patriots' luck has run out. Their luck? Now that, that Brady is not there. Luck, luck is crazy. Their, their reign of terror oh, I agree. has run out. Oh, they're the not, reign of terror has been over. They're not it's scary. Been over. It's the they're Bills. Not, they're not scary. It's the Bills in the AFC East They're now. not scary anymore. They're not. They're, they're not the boogeyman. No. The not. Jets are. Okay. We're coming them. Okay. For sure. What's Buffalo then if we're for the book event? The God? <laughs> like, <laughs> Buffalo is Michael Myers. I don't know. It's something like that. Yeah, no. Their, their time is over, at least for the Patriots. Yeah. But I'm happy. they Their reign of terror lasted far, far too long. The Giants cut James Bradbury, and uh, people were... Th- this was kind of a move in the works for a while. Like, we knew he was going to get cut eventually. We just never knew when. I thought this was going to happen much sooner, but... The reasoning for people wondering out there why James Bradbury got cut because he is a very good corner is that the Giants only had $7 million in cap space and they could not sign any of their rookies without cutting James Bradbury. Damn. So cutting him freed up $10 million in cap space, which then allowed them to sign Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal and all their other rookies, which is a good thing, but you also lost a good corner and... I feel for Giants fans because James Bradbury is a good corner. Um, Dave Gettleman is just his, the dark cloud still looming over the Giants with this move with Dave Gettleman's tenure, even though that dark cloud won't be looming for long. But you look at the contracts he handed out four years, 72 million to Kenny Galladay, three years, 63 million to Leonard Williams. Leonard Williams is making 27 million this year Jeez. for somebody who's just a good 27? player. Seven. Yeah. He's not a great, he's not a, he's just a good player. So Dave Gettleman has done disastrous things to the Giants organization. And now Joe Shane and Brian Dable are trying to pick up the scraps. And that's what this James Bradbury move is. It wasn't a bad move. It was a good move. This is something they had to do to fix the team. But now it really brings into question their secondary. Their secondary in total has 107 combined starts. To put that into perspective, Darius Slay has 124 alone. You're looking at Adorier Jackson, Cordell Flott, Flott, Aaron Robinson, third round pick last year, Rodarius Williams, Darnay, Hol- Darnay Holmes, and their their safeties I like. Xavier McKinney and Julian Love, I like that, but their corners are god awful. Adorier Jackson had a good year last year, but history has shown he gets injured. He's inconsistent. You can't count on him. And outside of Odorier Jackson, you can't count on anybody on the Giants secondary. Yeah. So their secondary is going to be one of the worst in the league, like without a doubt. Yeah. And it's not only like the cornerbacks, the players they have, but it's also like their position. Adoree Jackson's an outside corner. He's a boundary corner without a doubt. But Darnay Holmes is a slot corner. Jaron Williams, he didn't play much, but he split time between slot and out wide. He's, he's about 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, and their third round pick, Cordell Flott, is 6'1", 175, but played mostly in the slot at LSU. So it's not like, I understand James Bradbury like that. It cut him to sign the rookies and whatnot, but he was one of their very few legitimate outside boundary cornerbacks. And the Giants this season, they're going into it knowing they're not going to compete. So it makes sense. Probably from both sides, Bradbury maybe goes, signs to the contender. 
while the Giants want to play some of their younger guys. And you mentioned it. His contract was probably not the best one that Gettleman gave out, which is one of the reasons why he's not with the Giants anymore, even though he did resign instead of uh, get fired. I'm not sure if you mentioned the contract. It was three years, $43 million with 30 guaranteed. Um, signed that in 2020. Gets cut in 2022. He was phenomenal in 2020, though. I'll give him credit. You know, yeah. if... Any team out there looking for cornerback help, if they think he'd get back to that 2020 form, he probably won't. Though. He, he probably won't. But that season, he allowed 450 yards on 44 receptions. I mean, he was one of uh, like a legitimate shutdown corner. I remember Terry McLaurin struggled against him for sure. Um, and then in 2021, this past season, he allowed 730 yards on 60 receptions. So he wasn't nearly as good. Um, obviously, it's 2020, but. Bradbury still has the ability to come in and contribute to a team. You know, the, the Chiefs are, look like I, they got McDuffie, so maybe not as bad, but he could play slot and they could bring up uh, uh, Bradbury to play corner. So there's a few teams out there that have Super Bowl hopes or think they can make a deep playoff run, and that's going to be a chance for Bradbury to go and contribute. The Giants, just the way their team has been constructed, the way their team is right now, this is just Joe Shane cutting dead weight. You know, the, the money is a part, but it's also just kind of getting rid of all of that Gettleman nonsense. It's similar to what Joe Douglas did when McCagnan left, getting rid of Le'Veon Bell and a few, and trading Leonard Williams, who we didn't want to pay $27 million for. So this is just the new GM coming in, cutting dead weight from the old GM, the mistakes he made. It wouldn't surprise me if we see Leonard Williams get uh, get cut next season. I'm not sure uh, how many years he has left on his contract, but the fact he's getting $27 million as an interior defensive lineman, which is one of the reasons why we traded him away. So um, it wasn't a surprise, like you mentioned, this has been a rumor that's been going around for some months now. A bit surprising that nobody, you know, even wanted to offer a fifth or sixth round pick for him. Maybe that that a, uh, a Texans trade fell through. Okay, yeah. um, maybe it was just that dead cap hit uh, that teams are worried over that cap hit in general. They didn't want to take on because it was I want to say around eleven, twelve million dollars. Um, but for someone to be able to be a starting boundary corner, he's going to get picked up. Um, but yeah, this was something that that makes sense for both sides. You're right, and teams that I have listed out here that maybe can get him, the Steelers need help at corner. The Raiders need help at corner desperately yeah. after losing Casey Hayward. The Patriots also. The Bengals, if they want to go out and get a corner, even though I don't know if they'll, they'll do it because they drafted Dax Hill and he's going to be he's, their slot. They, they have a woozy A. You know, maybe it they can have, happen. I mean, but they have Eli Apple. They have Mike Hilton to play slot. who was pretty solid last year, but he would be an upgrade over Apple. Arizona is another team who they need Desperate. cornerback help. But the, the, teams, the team that... I want James Bradbury to go to it's Philadelphia Eagles. A Darius Slay with James oh, Bradbury. Stay in division. Defensive do it to line them like is that? great. I think that would be awesome. I think the Eagles to me are already the best team in the NFC East. Yeah. They have the best roster. James Bradbury goes there. It just takes them that it just makes them that much better. He yeah, I think and, he fits with them. The him, best. And Dar- him and Darius Slay would be a really good, yeah. a really good cornerback duo. And obviously they have one of the best defensive lines in the NFL too. Um, they have been missing that that second corner for a couple seasons now. They brought in Slay last year, and who is phenomenal for them, um, one of the best corners in the NFL. But yeah, they're, that's definitely a team that makes sense. Uh, Giants fans would be sick if he yeah. goes to Philadelphia, stays in division. Obviously, between them and Dallas, I don't know who they hate more. Yeah. Um, but that that would sting for a lot of Giants fans. But outside of Philly, the Commanders could be a team. If you know, I know they signed William Jackson. They have Kendall Fuller, but he can be an option. I wouldn't sleep on the Rams. The Rams tend to get every big name guy. Facts. They need help at corner too, next to Jalen Ramsey. If you have Jalen Ramsey and Bradbury, I mean that becomes very scary. So there are a lot of teams here, but I think if I were to bet on a team, I think the Eagles probably land him. The Eagles, yeah, that'd Darius Slay has already pitched to pitched to him to come to Philly already. So there's that. Of course. But I think he probably could come there. Now on to the last segment of the podcast. Top 10 teams in the NFL post-draft. Now, this isn't based off of where they finished last year, although it has something to do with it. We're ranking rosters. So top 10 teams, top 10 rosters heading into the 2022 uh, NFL season post-draft. Starting at 10? How are we doing this? Back and forth? Or I go, you go? What do you want to do? We can go back and forth. Okay. Starting at 10? Yeah. I'll start. Uh, Baltimore Ravens, number 10. I was so this ten between two teams, but I went with the Eagles. Okay, the Eagles, great offensive line, defensive line, weapons. Jalen Hurts is my guy. Yeah, but I went with the Ravens at ten just because their secondary is back. Lamar Jackson improved it's offensive him. line, it's him. running game. I think they'll run the ball very well. You know, no arm, no arm, Lamar. Not sure how he's going to do. Can take that back. I'm not take sure. Weapons aren't there. Are you going to take back no arm, Lamar? Come on. 
Like, don't do it because I'm gonna the entire season. I'm gonna say you said that if, if that's the case. If you want to run with that, go for you it. You never know. So okay. I'm not no sure. Lamar. Sixteen. No arm Lamar. Sixteen touchdowns, thirteen picks. Right. I don't know. Unanimous MVP, youngest ever. Cool. Well, yeah, 2018. That's three years ago, man. 2018. 2019. It. 2019. That's 2019. three years ago, man. Get you love it. to talk about Matt Ryan, so please don't. We're not gonna talk about 2019. He, he, you love to bring up like Matt 2016. Ryan has Matt Ryan. Success. That's what he has. He has no. He has number no nine. Green, been in the league for 15 years. Number nine for me is Green Bay Packers. I, you know, for me, I know people are going to be like, oh, but they don't have any receivers. Uh, come, We got to stop this. Like, their roster top to bottom is amazing. Their defensive line got better with Devontae Wyatt. Rashawn, they have Rashawn Gary, Kenny Clark, Preston Smith. Like, their linebackers getting that much better. They they brought back Devontae Campbell. They added Quay Walker. Jair Alexander is healthy. Their secondary is amazing. Their offensive line is going to be better. Robert Tunyon healthy. The running back duos are amazing. The running back duo is amazing. Yeah, they don't have that those wide receivers, but one, don't sleep on Christian Watson. Two, <laughs> it's not the end all be all. Top to bottom, their team is amazing, and Aaron Rodgers will make it work regardless. Imagine if the Packers got Odin Tate, man. They might win the whole thing. Um, my number nine team is the Baltimore Ravens. You have them at 10. Trading Hollywood hurts, obviously, um, but I love the rest of the roster. They improved the offensive line with Linderbaum and Morgan Moses, brought in uh, Kyle Hamilton and Marcus Williams to really solidify that secondary. Hamilton will probably play uh, some linebacker, some box safety, however you want to call it. Defensive line should be great with Michael Pierce, Clay Campbell. And, you know, the weapons are sketchy, but you have Andrews and you have Rashad Bateman. This is still going to be a run-heavy team. You get J.K. Dobbins back. You get Gus Edwards back. And I think it's going to go back to that 2019 offense where you, uh, Lamar did win unanimously. MVP. It's going to be run heavy. They brought in a, a tight end as, as well. I want to say, don't remember. They drafted a tight end actually, as I likely, right? Is that yeah. who it is? And Charlie um, Kohler. Okay. Yeah. So I think they're going to go back to being more run heavy than they have, uh, especially last season. They they didn't really run a ton. They were like around 20th in terms of like pass percentage in terms of plays, where in 2019 they were dead last. So I think they're going to get back to that run heavy offense, which is why I think losing Hollywood's not going to be, you know, a huge deal for them. Number eight, Kansas City Chiefs. Now, eight and seven are inter- interchangeable for me, but I'm going eight with Kansas City. Defensively, I thought they improved immensely. I do think the Tyreek Hill loss is going to be a loss nonetheless. It can be significant. But I just feel like the Chiefs last year started off really slow, even though they picked it up later in the season. They started off slow, and maybe there's a chance for that to happen this year. I don't think the team that is ahead of them is going to have that slow of a start. Because of that, I have the Chiefs at eight, but they're still a great roster of contenders for sure, without a doubt. I have the Packers at eight, and I don't feel great about it. Uh, you know, the Packers are a team that the roster is good every year. They have arguably the best quarterback every season. The last couple of years, they had the best wide receiver every season and arguably the best corner. So they've had all of the things you could possibly want on a team, and it just hasn't worked out. I mean, relative, right? They haven't won a Super Bowl. They haven't gone to a Super Bowl. They've had playoff success. They've gone to uh, NFC Championship games and been number one seed. So they've had success. It's just, I don't view this as the year they get over the hump. I don't view this as a season where they, you know, cut through, they get to a Super Bowl. They're able to get past the Rams, the 49ers, Tampa Bay, whoever it might be. I don't look at it this season, but they still have to be in my top 10 because they have LaFleur and Rodgers, one of the best head coach and quarterback, probably the best over the, uh, since LaFleur has gotten there in terms of win percentage. So the Packers are still eighth for me, but I don't feel great about it. The NFC overall is weak, so they're going to have a really good record. So I have to put them in here, but they're really not in my Super Bowl bubble. Number seven, Denver Broncos. Now, they have a really good roster. Russell Wilson now changes the outlook on that team. They got better in their defensive line. Bradley Chubb's healthy. Randy Gregory. They drafted Nick Benito. Benito. Uh, They got Jones from San Francisco, who I think was a pretty good uh, pickup. So they got some players. Their secondary could use some work outside of Pat Sertan. I don't know who else is there, but they're definitely, they have a direction at least. I think the Broncos have a better roster than the Chiefs, in my opinion. Um, Didn't bring up Bradbury to the Broncos. They need corner help. Oh yeah, maybe Drew. Drew yeah, that was maybe, maybe Drew randomly happen. DM'd our Instagram group chat. What do you, I don't even know what he said. He said we need him or something. I yeah, like so. he didn't even send anything. He just said like Bradbury or something. I was like, what are you talking about, bro? Um, but I think the Broncos are seven for me. I, I think okay. just just the Russell Wilson fra- factor 
makes Huge. them a little bit re- makes the, it gives them energy it brings life like yeah. we finally have a chance here for sure because we have a quarterback so that's why i have them at seven yeah i have the Bengals at seven um you know joe burrow jamar chase higgins boyd mixing the offense is ridiculous the offensive line has been upgraded this season lyle collins said karis alex kappa and one of my favorite players in the draft was dax Sill. he's someone who could play free safety or slot corner day one extremely athletic he's a solid tackler so the Bengals, i were i was a little low on them coming into the season um, obviously, I mean, we're in May, so we have a, a ton to go. I don't think the Jets can have a better record than them. I know I, I said that in like February, um, but it wouldn't shock me if they're one of the teams that missed the playoffs this upcoming season. Um, just cause you know, they went to the Super Bowl. They had a lot of things go their way. I know people hate me for saying they got lucky, but every team that goes to the Super Bowl in NFL history got lucky one way or another. And the Bengals are part of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the Bengals number seven right now, there's a few teams in the AFC. I like more than them, but I mean, Joe Burrow is on the cusp. If he's not a superstar or if he's not that elite tier one quarterback, he's damn close to it. The leadership's there. The skill is there. They have the weapons to do it. Um, it's just a matter of, is there going to be any Super Bowl hangover? And you know, what is, what is this team and what is this? Uh, AFC North look like now with a healthy Lamar, Deshaun Watson, and an upgrade at quarterback for Pittsburgh. Number six, the Indianapolis Colts. They Stand had yourself. They had the most pro bowlers in the NFL last season. That's sick. They added Stephon Gilmore. They added Matt Ryan. This team's just going to get better. For me, I don't know. If you look at their roster top to bottom, it's a top five. That's why it's, I have them here. It's a good roster. It's a top six roster in the NFL, and you know, everybody wants to talk about the co- like defensive line. I didn't even mention Yannick Ngakwe. Defensive line got better. Grover Stewart, DeForest Buckner, yeah. Yannick Ngakwe, Quiddy Pay, linebackers, DeForest Buckner. I mean, linebackers, Darius yes. Leonard, um, Okariki, Zare, Stephon Gilmore, Kenny Moore, Isaiah Rogers was really good last year. I mean, this team is amazing. People want to talk about the receivers. What about the weapons? Well, I mean, one, you have one of the best weapons in football in Jonathan Taylor, yes. who is arguably can be the best running back in the league this year if he wants to. If Derrick Henry doesn't stay healthy, which he didn't last year. And Michael Pittman, low end number one. I'll give it to him. Stop sleeping on Alec Pierce. (laughs) I beg you. Alec Pierce is going to be the real deal. 700 to 800 yards this year receiving without a doubt. And... We're not even talking about what Paris Campbell can be. Oh, bro. I, come Paris on. Paris come Campbell. On. Come on. I'll give you I'm Alec Pierce. Let's not, let's not do Paris Campbell. Unfortunate situations. He's been injured. He has been. He stays healthy. What? He can, he can, Why is this the year when he has two two receivers Matt over Ryan's him now? Because Matt Ryan is there. Matty Ice going to make sure his muscles is iced and he's going to be ready to play. And then don't uh, sleep on Naheem Hines out, out the oh, backfield. He's a solid. He's one catches, of the best receiving backs 70 in catches in 2020. He didn't have it with Carson Wentz because he doesn't check down. I'm telling you, the Colts, stop sleeping on them. Well, Jonathan stop. Taylor also didn't get going until the second half of 2020. Stop sleeping on the Colts. Work. Um, listen, I like the Colts. I think they're a, I think they're a good team. I think they can compete for the division. They might win the division. Um, I just outside of Jonathan might. Taylor, they might. It's between them and Tennessee. Come on, man. I, I might give the slight edge, like fifty five percent leading Colts right now. Right, I, I do on, give man. them a little bit of the edge, but I just. The rest of these teams are explosive. They're dynamic. We have the Bengals. We're going to talk about, spoiler, we're going to talk about the Chargers and the Rams and all these teams, right, that are just explosive. And even the teams behind them, like the Broncos and and Ravens and Eagles, who have these explosive, dynamic playmakers. And the Colts, it's Jonathan Taylor. Michael Pittman is this borderline wide receiver one, and you have an aging, older Matt Ryan who's really not explosive anymore. So I look at the Colts, and while they have a good team, you mentioned the most pro bowlers last year. That's fine and dandy. They missed the playoffs. Now, sure, Carson Wentz was not good down the stretch. Matt Ryan is going to come in, and he's going to be better consistently than Carson Wentz. Statistically, though, he's probably going to put up similar numbers to what Wentz did. All he has to do is not be terrible down the stretch, which is what Wentz was last season. So I don't even have the Colts in my top 10. I think six is ridiculous, truthfully. Um, I, I don't know how. I'm curious to hear. So, sorry, you had them at six. Remind me seven through ten again. Broncos, Chiefs, Packers, Ravens. Yeah, they're all over the Colts, and I don't think it's that close. Um, But anyone, I'll go anywhere. I'll go on to my number six team, the Denver Broncos. Number one, far away, you mentioned the Russell Wilson trade tra- changes everything about this team. About Let me the ask culture. you a question real quick before you sure. go on your soliloquy. Lamar Jackson, if he's on the Colts, yeah. are they not the sixth best roster in the league? Yeah, well, Lamar Jackson's a significantly better quarterback than Matt Ryan. Not too sure about that. Yeah. What? Matt what? Ryan is him. 
Bro, no, he's not. Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan is, is good. Him. He's not him, bro. We can't just throw out, throw but I'm around just saying, him like it's anything. Th- but th- that's what I'm saying, though. So if the Colts had Lamar, you might have ranked them top three. If you could put Lamar, like he's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, of course. If you get a significant upgrade at quarterback for half the teams so in the Russell NFL, so Russell Wilson goes on the Colts. They're they're top five, right? They're top ten. They're top. They might be. They mm, they're they're. I mean, the, the Broncos at six, so the Colts will probably be around here too. You're sleeping on Matt Ryan. You I'm think Matt Ryan's going to be as good as Russell Wilson, Lamar Jackson? Can he can put up better stats this year? Yep, he can. Yep, he can for sure, bro. Yep, bro. Yep, bro. Maybe not Russell, Lamar. Yes, total yards, total touchdowns. Well, I'm talking about passing. No, but no, but that's not fair. That's what a quarterback that's does. Not, that's not fair though. That's what a quarterback does. That's not fair because Lamar Jackson changes the game with his legs. Okay, I understand that, but I'm talking about passing. Passing well, yards. I don't, I don't care when Lamar Jackson's the best rushing quarterback in NFL. Well, history. Matt Ryan doesn't need that because he has JT. I understand, but th- Lamar also doesn't have to be a spectacular passer because he's the best rushing quarterback ever. But I caught you. You see that? You you think the Colts are this great of a roster? They have a really good you, roster. You just didn't prop them up into top ten because they're not explosive of Matt, enough. Because of Matt Ryan, That's they're not why. explosive I, enough. I know what you and did. No, now. no, no. And you, Matt Ryan. no, because you said if you give them Russell Wilson, Lamar, two of the most explosive quarterbacks in the NFL, that changes things. But you have Matt Ryan, who he's good, but he's not great. He's he's like the ninth or eighth best quarterback in the AFC. You give them Stafford. There's a top seven roster. If you give them Stafford, they'd probably be like eight through ten. They'd probably be ten, maybe nine. Out of here. Matt Ryan's he's not him, bro. He's like he. Watch. He's not him. He's like a, like a little bit. Like he's all right. Watch. Um, moving on from that ridiculous. He has the same Colts pronouns six. as him. He slash him. But not everyone same goes. He, he might be a he slash they. I don't know. He might not, might not go by him. Matt Ryan is he him. <laughs> That's who he is. Oh man. Um. Anyhow, moving on to my sixth team, the Denver Broncos. You talked about them already, so I won't go in depth. But Russell Wilson trades changes everything. The only reason I have them six instead of these and a few teams above them is just because the receiving core of Sutton, Judy, and Tim Patrick isn't as proven as the rest of the guys. But I love their tight end room as well with Alberto and Dolchich, probably the most athletic tight end room in the NFL. Yep. And defensively, a little worried because Fangio leaves, but you have still have Sertain Simmons who's going to you know lock up that secondary. DJ Jones was a great pickup in the interior. Randy Gregory and, and Bradley Chubb, what's going to happen there? You know, Bradley Chubb had zero sacks last season after being a top five pick a couple years ago. Randy Gregory, to me, seemed to get a bit overpaid. He's had um, some issues of his own as well. So um, depending on how great this uh, this defense is, if they're top three defense again, they might be the number one seed. But I worry about that with Fangio leaving. With this top five, I feel like a lot of our teams are going to be the same. So I'll go rapid fire here. Yeah. Number five, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Self, self-explanatory. Added Russell Gage. Brought back most of their guys. Number four, Cincinnati Bengals added offensive line help Lyle Collins, Alex Kappa. You also added Ted Caras to that mix. I feel like they're going to be much improved, at least offensive line-wise. Number three, the Chargers. Khalil Mack, I mean, huge. Then you go get J.C. Jackson, Sebastian Joseph Day. You just signed Kyle Van Noe. Like, this roster is ridiculous from top to bottom. Number two, the Rams have to respect them still. They added Allen Robinson, Bobby Wagner, Super Bowl champs. Number one is Buffalo, though. Devon Miller signing to me is the, that alone makes them, to me, the best roster in the NFL. We have similar teams. There's a couple in here I, that I think uh, you didn't have. Five for me, I think you had them out of the top five was the Chiefs. Uh, great offensive line, you know. Chris, uh, Chris Jones, Herloftis in that front seven. Nick Bolton, that linebacker. Sneed brought in uh, McDuffie, too. You have some questionable weapons. I mean, you have Juju, MBS, Brandon Sky Moore, CH, who knows, Hardman, who knows. Obviously, Travis Kelsey is going to be the guy there. Um, but I still have the Chiefs at five. Patrick Mahomes and, and Andy Reid didn't even mention don't have to, um, but they're still a top five team to me. Number four is the Chargers. Upgrade the offensive line. Zion Johnson's a first round pick. Upgrade defensive line with Sebastian Joseph Day. And as you mentioned, Khalil Mack, that was a huge trade for them to get some edge help, rush the passer. Duran James able to stay healthy for a full season last year. Hopefully he's able to do that again. And then the offensive talent with Herbert, Eckler, Keenan, Mike Williams. And one uh, player I didn't mention who I really liked was Isaiah Spiller, who they got on day three. Backup running back. Someone they've been looking to fill that, that role for. You know, they had Melvin Gordon and Eckler for a while. Melvin Gordon left. They had Eckler, but never really felt, uh, found that wide uh, running back two role. Number three, the Rams still one of the top dogs in the NFC. Stafford and Cup year two together. Who knows how, you know, if, if Cup's able to put together one of that historic seasons again. 
traded out a rob or traded out woods for Allen robinson brought in bobby wagner you got cam Akers healthy kyle van Noy, as you mentioned sean McVay, still one of the best head coaches of the nfl Two tampa bay buccaneers tom brady once again has another loaded team brought in shaq mason to upgrade an already fantastic offensive line we know the weapons even if uh, gronk doesn't come back you still have cameron bray who's phenomenal um for net rashad huh so, sorry that was rude that was rude He's a phenomenal backup. Phenomenal backup is what I was what I was he's going at there. He Cameron right. He's phenomenal. <laughs> he's a phenomenal backup. Is I think that's what I was going for there. Um, brought in, re-signed Fournette, drafted Rashad White, who was Drew is one of his favorite running backs. Did lose uh, Whitehead to the Jets, but still solid secondary with Winfield, uh, Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean. So got some guys there. As you mentioned though, my number one team, the Buffalo Bills, the most complete team to me in the NFL. Josh Allen is probably the best quarterback in the NFL. If not number one, he's number two. Brought in Jamison Crowder. You still have Stephon Diggs, your boy Gabe Davis, who I am not as high on. Um, solid O-line, Von Miller, uh, Kyer Elam, Trey White's back. Great safety duo. The Bills are ridiculous. Can they get over the hump? Can they beat the Chiefs this year? That's the real question. People don't talk about it enough, but they were 13 seconds away from stopping the homes. Do people not talk? I think we talked about it enough. Winning the Super Bowl. People talked about that for like weeks. They should have won it. They though. changed the overtime. They would have beat the it. Rams. You think? Yep. They would have beat the Rams. Would they beat the Bengals? Yeah. They'd beat the Bengals. Okay. I think they would have beat the Bengals. You're, you're low on. I mean, yeah, that fits your narrative of the whole Rams thing, so it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the Buffalo Bills don't sleep this year. I think this year they get it done. You think so? Yep. I'd, yeah. The Bills are like, I also think they can win the Super Bowl, but it also scares me because everyone thinks they're going to win the Super Bowl. Everyone thinks Josh Allen's going to win MVP. So that scares me a little bit. And I feel the same way about the Jets that everyone's like my, you know, my uh, dark horse this year is the Jets. My dark horse for MVP is Zach Wilson. Like when everyone's on the same train, I get scared and I kind of get that vibe from the Bills this year. So that you don't think Zach Wilson's going to break out because of that? I wouldn't say that, but I think everyone's on the Jets train after this ridiculous draft that um, I think people are expecting them to be phenomenal playoff locks when I think if they get eight wins, I would be ecstatic. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So that's going to do it for episode 178 of the Pick Aside podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Pick Aside Podcast, on Twitter at Pick Aside Pod, and buy merch of ours on PickAsidePodcast.com. Thank you guys for listening and or watching, and we'll see you next time.